respected uh, pratibha madam respected vasant sir all the faculty members of pathology department all the participants and all the dignitaries of dais on dais who have come for this wonderful cme on lymphoma a warm welcome to you all from the tamilgi medical college and shalini tai medical hospital valladolid nagpur as such basically i am a pediatrician but associated with hodgkins lymphoma children for almost 32 years and so lymphoma as such the topic itself is very close to my heart and i'm highly honored and it's a great privilege for me to be here on the invitation of dr pratibha davande madam who has taken so much efforts to organize this wonderful cme for you all which will be totally an academic feast and uh, my sincere thanks to madam for inviting me over here my namaskar and pranams to the stalwarts of pathology dr anand pathak sir Meena Pangalkar, Madam, and many of you who are there, mostly from the National Cancer Institute. It was, in fact, a dream come true to have a National Cancer Institute at this particular Nagpur city, and I am very highly honoured to be a Nagpurian to have you all over here. A warm welcome and greetings to you all. My best wishes for a wonderful academic deliberation. Which you all will really enjoy, and every participant will take a lot of knowledge, will gain a lot of academic feast, and I wish my best wishes to all of you. Once again, thank you, Pratibha Madam, for giving me this lovely opportunity to be amongst you, and welcome you, invite you, and greet you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It is really great to have your guidance and support all the time. As we come to the culmination of the inauguration ceremony, I would like to request Dr. Anita Sarina, Professor, Department of Pathology, Delta Medical Medical College, to give both of her hands. On behalf of organizing team, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Concluding this inaugural ceremony by expressing our gratitude, we would like to thank Chancellor DMIMS DU Honorable Datta Ji Mehta Sir, Pro Chancellor DMIMS DU Honorable Dr. Vedh Prakash Mishra Sir for their rock solid support in all our university ventures. We extend our gratitude towards Honorable Sagar Ji Mehta Sir and Honorable Samir Ji Mehta Sir for always motivating us. We thank. Vice Chancellor DMIMS DU Honorable Dr Raju Porle Sir Pro Vice Chancellor DMIMS DU Honorable Dr Lalit Vaghmare Sir Registrar DMIMS DU Dr Baba Ji Gevde Sir for their support in our all ventures our heartfelt thanks to our beloved dean DMMS DMMC Nagpur respected Dr Dilip Gode Sir for guidance and constant support without your able guidance nothing is possible for us sir a very th a special thanks to dean academics dmmc nagpur respected dr sandhya katse madam for her able guidance thank you assistant registrar dr ranji tambad sir chief medical superintendent dr vasant gavande sir medical director uh, dr surendra gode madam for your support words are short to express our gratitude for director nci respected Dr Anand Patak sir uh, HOD Laboratory Medicine National Cancer Institute respected Dr Meena Pangarkar madam and their whole team for not only sparing their invaluable time for us to grace this occasion but also enlightening us with their informative talks we are very much thankful to our chairpersons Dr Pradeep Kumar sir professor and hod peoples medical college bhopal dr prachi sanjeevi renowned pathologist and president vapm who have given their precious time and chairing the sessions i thank sponsor dg shield for this webinar i need to thank it team and support staff of dmmc nagpur for their technical support i thank quality manager prabhat sir who could manage whole webinar so well last and most importantly 
I thank all the participants on behalf of Department of Pathology Events in Nagpur, without whom such ventures are just incomplete. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. We will start the dialogue session soon.
I request Dr. Pradeep Kumar Sir, ex-professor of Government Medical College, Nagpur, and currently professor in equity at People's Medical College, Bhopal, to chair the session. We welcome Dr. Anand Patak Sir, Medical Director, NCI Nagpur. After the post-graduation degree from GMC Nagpur in medicine, he joined Tata Memorial Hospital as medical oncology resident. He has served as associate medical oncologist at PD Hinduja National Hospital, Mumbai. He is a member of American Society of Clinical Oncology, European Society of Medical Oncology, and Indian Cooperative Oncology Network. He has authored many publications in reputed journals. With this introduction, we would like to present before you our first speaker, Dr. Anand Patak, sir. He will be enlightening us on clinical approach and evaluation of lymphoma case. Dr. Patak, sir, please. So, uh, good morning. Uh, my topic is to uh, highlight on clinical approach and evaluation of case of lymphoma. Uh, thanks for the invitation for this uh, meeting. And what I would do next few minutes is to just share a few points about how do we approach a suspected case of uh, lymphoma in the clinic. So in terms of challenges in making a lymphoma diagnosis and treatment, there are three tiers of challenges. The first and foremost is how to suspect a case of lymphoma. I'll come to that in a few minutes. And then what are the challenges in pathological diagnosis? And I'll touch upon the clinician's perspective. And there are lectures to follow which would highlight this further. Uh, I'll just briefly up, uh, touch upon the broad approach to treating lymphomas. Uh, I cannot cover the treatment in details in this lecture. So we all know uh, the lymphatic system uh, consists of nodes distributed across the body, the lymphatics, the liver, spleen, and a bone marrow. And lymphocytes reside in variety of organs in the tissue. Uh, so when we imagine a case of lymphoma, typically we think about uh, lymphadenopathy, enlargement of liver and spleen, and detailed health symptoms of fever, B symptoms like weight loss, night sweats, fatigue, and loss of appetite. And with this uh, symptom trial, it's very easy to suspect lymphoma and do the workup appropriately. But quite often we see presentations that don't fit typically into this uh, classic uh, presentation. And I'll just uh, quote a few cases to highlight the same point. This patient uh, was a young male who presented uh, many years back to me in my clinic with history of fever since one year and he had spinomegaly. He underwent investigations outside and a splenic aspirator was also done, which showed granulomas. So accordingly, he was put on antitubercular treatment that provided no relief. He also received many other treatments, including antimalarials, but there was no relief. And finally, he underwent a splenectomy. And a splenectomy showed that it was a hepatosplenic gamma delta lymphoma. Then he received six chop. Uh, his bone marrow was involved, which is confirmed by ISC, and their plan was to proceed with high dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplantation. Quite often, if you do a marrow in such patients, often the diagnosis of lymphoma will be clinched instead of subjecting the such patients to invasive uh, uh, procedures like a laboratory. Another case, a doctor by profession had fever since two years and underwent repeated investigation, received multiple antibiotics, antitubercular therapy, antimalarials, multiple hospitalizations, and repeated scans. And then the second or third scan showed that there were few nodes in the retroperitoneum, which were FNSC, and the FNSC was negative. Finally, he was put on he was subjected to a mineral laparotomy and a node biopsy. And then the biopsy in the IAC showed that this was a case of Hodgkin's disease, mixed cellularity. So the take home point in this case is to insist on a tissue diagnosis, even if there is a TB as, a as the first differential, it is quite justified to go ahead and do a laparoscopic biopsy or mineral laparotomy and prove that this is a lymphoma or something else. Another patient, a 70-year-old man who had multiple skin rashes all over, which were maculopapillar, nodules, and polyps. 
and he also had erythema of the skin. Now it's uh, it, it's very difficult to imagine lymphoma as the first differential, but this he underwent biopsy, and the IAC showed it to be a cutaneous B cell lymphoma. This patient presented with a very round, well-defined lesion in the left lung, and immediately one would think of either a hydratid cyst, some kind of an abscess, or some kind of uh, a neoplasm or a, a, a solitary metastasis in the lung. He underwent a biopsy in IAC. It was a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And this was a CT scan. He underwent six cycles of arch shock. At the end of uh, the arch shock, you see that the lesion has undergone total cavitation. This lady, young lady, presented with a very large, uh, uh, fearful looking, grotesque, ulcerated mask in the, involved in the right breast. And this was a burkitt like lymphoma. This another young lady presented with an inflamed jaw swelling on the left side, and biopsy was a high grade B cell lymphoma. She underwent therapy, and in the end of therapy, there was a complete remission. And so, uh, another case of a young man who presented with a soft tissue mass over the shoulder, and the first diagnosis was with a disease sarcoma. Biopsy and IC showed it to be diffuse large B cell lymphoma. He underwent therapy. At the end of therapy, he was in complete remission and alive and well today. A very unusual presentation, this patient, he underwent uh, evaluation for high blood pressure recorded during donation of blood in the camp. And his creatine was found to be very high, 1.8. And his initial IVP and the ultrasound showed by little obstructive neuropathy. And the CT scan, as you can see uh, in this figure, showed a very uh, fibrotic kind of lesion in the retroperitoneum. And the first suspicion was whether this is a retroperitoneal fibrosis. He underwent a trocar biopsy, and IAC showed it to be a follicular lymphoma, and he underwent therapy. This was in 2005, and he is still alive and well today. So point to be uh, taken home is a variety of presentation uh, patient can come with, and there could be lymphoma like in this symptom database for lymphoma. So uh, fever, nodes, B symptoms, it's easy to suspect lymphoma, but then, but then sometimes patient can just have uh, unexplained pruritus, cerebellar syndrome, vasculitis, ulcer, diarrhea, joint pains, bleeding PR, renal failure, sinusitis, a stroke, a backache, only effusion, or a breast mass, or an ulcer in the mouth, sinusitis, where it will be very, very difficult to suspect lymphoma, and often there is a surprise diagnosis of lymphoma. So we should insist on uh, a tissue biopsy, and, and even if the tissue may show just a morphology of uh, inflammation, it's important to su subject the tissue to an ISC, and there could be lymphoma. So that's the first challenge to suspect lymphoma. Once you suspect, then the clinical evaluation should include history, especially the B symptoms. Examination should uh, uh, evaluate the performance status of the patient, examination of all the uh, nodes, liver, spleen, and other systems. And a basic lab should uh, include the complete blood counts. Often the peripheral smear might show <coughs> mild lymphocytosis, and therefore you can do a flow on the peripheral blood and clinch the diagnosis, instead of doing a PET scan or invasive biopsies. LDH, ESR, <coughs> uric acid, especially in highly aggressive lymphomas, organ functions, and evaluation of viral serology, and a bone marrow evaluation. Adequate tissue biopsy is the first step in making the diagnosis of lymphoma because today a lymphoma diagnosis involves not only morphology but also immunosecondary in many cases molecular studies. It is sometimes very difficult to obtain an seasonal biopsy. A core biopsy sometimes is required and an experienced pathologist can make a complete lymphoma diagnosis on an adult core biopsy. And so, uh, the morphologically, the pathologist would tell you what kind of lymphoma this, it is like in this case, whether it's a small lymphocytic lymphoma, whether it's a large diffuse B cell lymphoma, or whether it's a Hodgkin's lymphoma. Occasionally, it's not possible even to do an adult core biopsy, and patient has an emergency, and you can sometimes, you are, the pathologist is called upon to diagnose the lymphoma based on smears, and then in case flow is available, the fluids can be subjected to flow cytometry and lymphoma diagnosis can be clinched. 
in uh, you all know this and this will be covered in next uh, few lectures that all lymphomas are basically classic and they're classified based on the characteristic antigen expression that they share and there are set and validated algorithms to make a diagnosis by isc the next uh, uh, lectures would cover this in details and then quite a few of lymphomas do have uh, characteristic genetic abnormalities which can be tested in the lab and that can assist in the is to make a diagnosis of a particular subtype of lymphoma so these are just few examples of ancillary techniques that are important to make lymphoma diagnosis like fish in this case uh, then in situ hybridization a pcr or a gene electrophoresis a gene expression profiling or uh, like in this case a mantis lymphoma where the characteristic genetic event can be uh, picked upon picked up in isc a double it lymphoma uh, which may can be seen to rearrangement can be uh, tested by in situ hybridization so all this help in clinching the diagnosis and um, giving valuable information to the clinician about the behavior of lymphoma in the clinic and selecting appropriate therapies and these are becoming increasingly important uh, in many cases of lymphomas the next step is to stage the lymphoma properly and here imaging is absolutely important if available uh, a pet scan is necessary in most of the lymphomas if not available you can do a ct scan of the neck chest and abdomen and that would tell you about the involvement of nodes neural distribution and whether the size of the lymph node is bulky or not so pet is extremely crucial it helps in improving the staging of lymphoma it may also help in guiding to select a biopsy site it is a, it, it adds to the prognostic value it helps in evaluation of the response uh, increasingly the clinicians use pet scan to uh, escalate or deescalate treatment based on the pet response and in the patient suspected to have a relapse it can help in evaluation of the disease distribution a lot of lymphomas are avid on pet some of them are not but most of them are so therefore pet is used almost in all lymphomas and as you can see here the pet scan scores over a routine ct scan and it picks up disease which is not seen on the routine ct scan and pet is also done <coughs> during treatment to evaluate early response and at the end of therapy and during sometimes in surveillance to monitor for a relapse and early response in the pet scan done uh, in 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 the middle of the treatment not only tells whether the treatment is acting well but also adds to the prognostic value as you can see here those who have a, a low prognostic score and their pet becomes negative very early in the treatment have a very long term survival so simplistically uh, this explains how we stage adult lymphomas pediatric lymphomas do have a separate staging system so it wouldn't be possible for me to cover that in this lecture so a stage one adult lymphoma is one where there is a single lymph node region involved on one side of a diaphragm a uh, stage 2 lymphoma is where two lymph node regions both on the same side of the diaphragm are, are are involved in case in addition to the nodal region involvement there is an external site involvement then the stage could be 1e or 2e when there are both sides of diaphragm involved uh, like in this case two nodal regions on, or one nodal region on one side and one on the other side other side could be nodal region or a spleen in this case this lymphoma would be classified as stage 3 a stage 4 lymphoma would involve either marrow or some non nodal site like uh, liver bones viscera or any other organ and based on what organism involved one can add a suffix to the stage like h in case of liver l for lung m for marrow p for pleura s for spleen o for bone and d for skin so appropriate staging of uh, the lymphoma is essential as it would not only help in prognostication and also assigning the patient to an appropriate treatment regimen so the who has classified lymphoma taking into account the morphology phenotype genetic and molecular features and also taking into account the epidemiology etiology pathogenesis clinical presentation evolution of, of the disease and prognostic parameters and response to treatment 
So WHO classifies lymphomas as disease entities, which are non-overlapping, and they're certified according to the sale of origin. And it is important for the clinicians to know this in order to uh, treat the patient accordingly. Increasingly, there is a, there is a subtype specific treatment for each lymphoma today. So this is an incomplete list of WHO classified lymphomas, and it's impossible to remember, but it's, it's impossible, it is important to know broadly whether the lymphomas are B cell, T cell, NK cell, mature cell or precursor cell. So clinicians broadly use this information to uh, classify a patient into broadly into whether it's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma. In case it's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, whether it's low-grade aggressive lymphomas or highly aggressive lymphomas. In case of highly aggressive lymphomas, there will be an emergency to start treatment. In case of low-grade lymphomas, the goal would be long-term care. And ex classical examples of low-grade include follicular or small lymphocytic lymphoma. Aggressive lymphomas classically include DLBCL and peripheral T cell lymphomas. Highly aggressive include lymphoblastic lymphomas, which is precursor lymphomas, or Burkitt's lymphomas. Hodgkin's broadly we approach NLPHL and others. NLPHL now we know behaves like low-grade lymphomas and has a different treatment approach than all other classical Hodgkin's lymphomas. And uh, we can take into account certain clinical in indices like stage of the lymphomas, performance status of the patient, age of the patient, and certain lab parameters like LDH. So there, there are, each, each case requires prognostication and there are validated guideline approved prognostic indices which take into account age, performance status of the patient, the stage of the disease, LDH values and total number of external sites. And uh, based on this, risk scores are calculated and the risk, risk scores can predict the overall survival rate. Like in this case, if the score is low, the five-year overall survival rate would exceed 90%. So it's, it's important to know in, in order to uh, select whether the treatment could be aggressive or less aggressive. There are now lymphoma subtype specific prognostic indices like in this case a flippy uh, index for follicular lymphoma an ipi or age, age adjusted ipf for diffuse large base lymphoma there are prognostic indices to assess the risk of spread to sanctuary sites like cns which is important to uh, from treatment point of view patients who have were at high risk of cns disease receive additional seen as directed therapy. And there are separate indices for T-cell lymphomas. So uh, one can use an, a guideline approved index uh, in the clinic. And so once the diagnosis is made, a staging is done, a prognostic index is calculated, and we have evaluated various patient-related factors. So next step is to select appropriate therapy. And then it's important to know for the clinician point of view whether the lymphoma in question is an indolent one or aggressive one or a highly aggressive one. For example, if the patient has a low-grade lymphoma which is localized, then only local therapy or sometimes even only watchful waiting would do. Not all patients would require therapy. Similarly, if the patient has an indolent lymphoma which is stage three or four, not everybody would require immediate treatment as the immediate treatment would not make any survival impact. Patients are evaluated in terms of symptoms or disease burden to select therapies. And there is an expanding area of therapies available for indolent lymphomas today. For even for recurrent lymphomas, because indolent lymphomas are rarely curable, they would often recur. There's an expanding uh, spectrum of later lines of therapy, so one can keep the patient uh, on intermittent treatment and prolonged survival. For highly aggressive lymphomas, everybody would require treatment. Treatment would be directed with the stage and would typically involve a combination of uh, multi-agent chemotherapy with or without an antibody like rituximab. And some patients would require addition of radiation at the end of therapy. For precursor uh, lymphomas, like lymphomas, like plastic lymphomas, the treatment would be highly intensive, similar to uh, acute leukemias. 
we do see Burkitt's lymphoma or Burkitt-like lymphoma in, adult, in the adults, and that, that again requires immediate and highly aggressive multidrug regimens. Even the recurrent adult lymphomas are now treatable with salvage regimen, followed by consolidation with stem cell transplantation, and there, there is an expanding spectrum of uh, novel therapies for recurrent lymphomas. I would just like to devote one slide to rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 antibody, which has revolutionized treatment of lymphoma in general. And it is often combined with chemotherapy and also used as a maintenance therapy in select lymphomas. So once we have diagnosed stage and uh, uh, prognostic lymphoma and selected appropriate therapy, we often refer to published guidelines uh, which uh, help us in selecting diagnostic workup as well as assigning the patient to an, uh, a meaningful clinical subset of uh, lymphoma, like in this case. In case it's a B cell lymphoma, then whether it's a follicular lymphoma, whether it's gastric malt, whether it's nodal marginal cell lymphoma, whether it's hybrid B cell lymphoma, whether it's Kesselman disease, and there are separate guidelines to do further diagnostic testing for each of these patients and separate guidelines to select appropriate treatment. And even for T cell lymphoma, there are separate guidelines to uh, assign a patient to an appropriate lymphoma subtype and select treatment. So, uh, uh, because there are now so many lymphomas that are recognized as distinct clinical entities and distinct biological entities, it is very important for all lymphoma therapists to refer to these guidelines so that the patient should receive the most appropriate evidence-based and latest uh, guideline-based treatment. And that would certainly improve the outcome. So just to conclude, it is important to know all this for the clinicians and even for the pathologists to have this working knowledge. Because lymphomas are not only uh, curable, they're also highly treatable. Like indolent lymphomas may not be curable, but sometimes the, long, the median survival could exceed 20 years. Therefore, it is important to know, uh, diagnose them and treat them appropriately. Aggressive lymphomas may have a short natural history, but they have high cure rates. And today with the modern therapy, the overall survival at five years goes above 60%. These patients do relapse. And it's important to pick up the relapse early so that they can be afford appropriate salvage therapies. And some patients can even be cured with salvage therapies. There are novel immunotherapies, novel targeted therapies, CAR T cells, which are emerging, which are improving the outcome in lymphomas. Hodgkin's lymphoma, again, is highly curable and predictable. Uh, it has a predictable relapse pattern, except in LPHL. And Hodgkin's lymphoma, again, even on relapse, can, uh, the patients can have a cure rate as high as 50%. So therefore, to conclude, it's important to suspect lymphoma, to diagnose, uh, diagnose them properly, to stage them properly, to prognostic them properly, and to use guideline-based approach to treat them properly. Thank you very much. So imparting a precious knowledge with us. To pay our respect and as a remembrance, we will be sending e mementos to all the speakers and chairpersons. Moving to the second speaker, may I request Dr. P Meena Pangarkar, Madam, Head Department of Laboratory Medicine, to enlighten us on immunohistochemistry of lymph node and few reactive hyperphasias. How we started learning about lymphomas. She was associate professor at GMC Nagpur. She has many publications in national and international journals to her credit. The session will be chaired by Dr. Uma Sir. Dr. Meena Ma'am, please. Good afternoon, everyone. After this lucid talk by Dr. Pathak. I will be sharing with you our experience of learning how to diagnose a lymphoma. When we started learning about lymphoma IHC, we first wanted to learn how a normal lymph node and then a reactive lymph node would look like on IHC. So I'll share with you our learning process. Lymph node structure has distinct areas, as you all know, capsule and subcapsular sinus, cortex with its follicles, which are both primary and secondary, the paracortical area, which contains lymphoid cells and high endothelial venules. This is the area in between the follicles, then the medullary cords and the sinuses. 
Today we will be concentrating more on the cortex and the paracortex. The cortex is made up of two types of follicles, primary and secondary, both having B lymphocytes. The primary follicle express BCL2, CD79A, CD20 and IgD antigens. They do not have germinal centers because they are not antigenically stimulated yet and therefore they do not express the germinal center markers BCL6 and CD10. When the primary follicles are immunologically stimulated, they develop a germinal center where the B cells will proliferate and switch classes of antigen receptors which will increase their affinity to any antigen. So these are called as secondary follicles and they develop new IHC markers which are CD10 which is a membranous marker and BCL6 which is a nuclear marker as you can see over here in the picture. Why is this important? Because a PAX, uh, also a PAX5 is expressed in the nucleus and why this PAX5 is important? Because whenever a lymphoma is treated with rituximab that is anti-CD20 treatment then when you reassess the lymph node or a relapse of a lymphoma, you will not be able to use the CD20 marker because those cells would have disappeared after treatment. Then we have to take the help of PAX5, which is also a B cell marker. Now these germinal centers do not have BCL2 because it is down-regulated in the germinal center. When the BCL2 is down-regulated, it is an anti-apoptotic uh, factor. Therefore, the proliferating B cells have a high apoptotic rate when it is down-regulated and the tangible body macrophages come in the germinal center to clear the cell debris which accumulates in the process of cell division. Additionally, what comes inside the germinal center is the T lymphocytes which are the called the T follicular helper cells. And these have a very specific importance in certain types of T lymphomas. The markers which are very specific to these T follicular helper cells are CD3, CD4, CD57 and PD1. And PD1 is an especially important one to remember in case of treatment of certain lymphomas. So to recap, the difference between primary and secondary follicles is a primary follicle is BCL2 positive, but a secondary follicle will have a germinal center which is BCL2 negative. A primary follicle does not have a germinal center, so it will be BCL6 negative, whereas a secondary follicle which has developed a germinal center becomes BCL6 positive. In addition to the uh, BCL6 uh, marker, what comes inside the germinal center is the follicular dendritic cells. These are present in both primary as well as secondary follicles, but when they develop a germinal center, they become very, very prominent. And what marks these out are the CD21 and the CD23 stains. The follicular dendritic cell network has a well demarcated spherical outline because that is the outline of the follicle itself. Germinal centers have proliferating B lymphocytes as we have seen and these are of two types. One are the centroblasts and these form a darker zone at the germinal center. One of the poles is rich in centroblasts and the paler one, the lighter area of the germinal center is made up of centrocytes and these two areas can be more specifically delineated when we do a proliferation marker which is Ki67. So the centroblast will show a very high Ki67 index and the centrocytes, the lighter area will show a very low Ki67 index. This also demonstrates the what is called as the polarity of the germinal center, which is a hallmark of a normal or a reactive secondary follicle. Coming to the T cell area, which is called the paracortical area and CD3 is a pan T cell marker, which you, you can see here is staining all the T lymphocytes in the paracortical area, which lies in between the follicles. 
This paracortical area also contains scattered interdigitating dendritic cells, occasional immunoblasts, and it is it has a very characteristic uh, venule uh, structure, which are called as high endothelial venules. These have very prominent cuboidal endothelial cells. The medulla is the central area of the lymph node, which contains numerous small lymphocytes in cords, which are called as medullary cords. These are B cells admixed with plasma cells, and these cords are surrounded by sinuses, which are lined by endothelial cells, and these sinuses contain scattered lymphocytes, histiocytes, and occasional granulocytes. Lymph node hyperplasia is said to be of four types. One is called as reactive follicular hyperplasia. All of us are familiar with this type of hyperplasia. Second is a diffuse hyperplasia, where we say the B and T areas cannot be made out, and we say that the structure looks effaced. Then we have a type of hyperplasia, which we call sinus histiocytosis, and then we can have a mixed pattern of all these hyperplasias together. We will be concentrating more on the reactive follicular hyperplasia today. This was a case, 52-year female who had a cytoreductive surgery done for bilateral ovarian carcinoma. Her pelvic node dissection uh, we were looking at, and then we could see some large lymph nodes which were showing prominent follicular pattern. These were, we couldn't see any metastasis, so these were negative for metastasis, but we were wondering what are these nodular follicles? Are they neoplastic or they are just reactive? So we did a IHC stain of CD20 and CD3 just to see what are the type of cells the, these follicles are made up of. And CD20 is positive, as you can see over here, and CD3 was negative. So these were B follicles. They did not contain any germinal center, which we confirmed by doing a BCL6 and a CD10 stain. So these are called as primary follicles, and this is a primary follicular hyperplasia. It's an uncommon reactive pattern of follicular hyperplasia where the germinal centers are very small or they may be totally absent. It is not associated with any specific conditions, but we keep seeing this type of hyperplasia, especially in radical neck dissections or modified RM, uh, MRM specimen axillary node dissections and mesenteric node dissections. These are made up of B cells, so they are CD20 and CD79A positive as well as PAX5 positive. And they are nothing but mantle cells, so they show a specific marker of mantle cells, which is IgD. And since they do not have a, uh, sorry, since they do not have a germinal center, BCL6 and CD10 are negative. So that is how we can differentiate that this is a primary follicle and not a secondary follicle. And what is the differential diagnosis? First thing that comes to mind is, is it a follicular type of uh, lymphoma or is it an in situ follicular neoplasia? Both these things, both these conditions will be of germinal center origin. So they will be positive for CD10 as well as BCL6. So we can differentiate primary follicular hyperplasia from follicular lymphoma or a in situ follicular neoplasia. Another differential is the nodular pattern of mantle zone lymphoma. You all know mantle zone lymphoma is cyclin D1 positive and there is a clonal proliferation, so we see a light chain restriction. So by doing a cyclin D1 stain, one can differentiate between these two conditions. Another differential one may think of are the proliferation centers of SLL, CLL, whether it is a, a small cell type of lymphoma. So we have to resort to CD5 and CD23 stains to differentiate between these two conditions. Let's look at this second case. This was an elderly gentleman who was a relative of doctors, and he noticed a small nodular thickening at the base of the tongue as, as well as a cervical lymph node, which was significantly enlarged. So the relatives were concerned, and they asked for a biopsy, which was done from both the sides. They were concerned that Maybe it is a lymphoma. On the biopsy, we could see uh, multiple secondary follicles with prominent germinal centers scattered all throughout the lymph node. 
So we signed it out as a reactive follicular hyperplasia and told them that there is nothing to worry about, there is no lymphoma. But they were very anxious, so they asked us to do an immunohistochemical stain and as expected, we could see that the cortex showed an expansion of uh, number of uh, expansion with number of uh, follicles, which were secondary follicles, and they were of variable size and shape. But the overall nodal architecture was preserved. The germinal centers were negative for BCL2 stain, so we assured them that. This was really a reactive lymphoid hyperplasia and there was no follicular lymphoma. More stains were done just to satisfy the uh, doctor relatives. We could see that these secondary follicles were having a prominent germinal center and CD20 was positive in the germinal center as well as in the mantle zone. And this was CD3 which showed a normal distribution in between the germinal centers because these are follicular helper cells, T cells as we have seen. CD10, cytoplasmic stain, BCL6, we could see normal distribution. CD21 showed a circumferential pattern of follicular dendritic cell and IgD stain showed a highlighting of the mantle zone showing an intact germinal center. So the relatives were assured that indeed this was a reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. What are the causes of differential, uh, differential diagnosis of secondary type of follicular hyperplasia? Many bacterial infections, syphilitic infection, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and few conditions which are have distinctive names like proliferative, uh, progressive transformation of the germinal center, Castleman's uh, disease, and HIV lymphadenopathy. All these entities show a pattern of reactive hyperplasia, which is of the secondary follicular hyperplasia. And in all these conditions, a differential diagnosis becomes a follicular pattern lymphoma, which is a follicular lymphoma. So one stain which is of very uh, great use is the BCL2 stain. And moreover, we can do a uh, clonal uh, study to study the light chain restriction and establish the clonality of the B cells. A small caveat in this type of uh, lymphoma is the BCL2 negative pediatric type of follicular lymphoma. We'll see about it in the later lecture. Coming to the one type of uh, reactive pattern is the case which we will see here. This was a young male with cervical lymphadenopathy. He had a prior history of viral fever and CBC was normal, but the parents were very anxious that this lymph node was not disappearing. So they got a PET done and which showed a PET avid node. So more worry and they got a lymph node biopsy done, which showed again, as you can see over here, a follicular hyperplasia with few such large follicles, which were composed of small lymphocytes and which had a germinal center, but this germinal center was very irregular. We could see it as a fragmented type of germinal center. So naturally, we did an IHC. What you can see are the CD20 follicles, the smaller ones as well as the larger ones, and they were BCL2 negative also. So they were reactive follicles, but we signed it out as a PTGC, which is called as a progressive transformation of germinal centers. This is a reactive process of undetermined cause, occurs in young males and usually results in a cervical lymphadenopathy. So this is a localized change. Not all follicles will show this, but few enlarged follicles will show such a pattern. So these macronodules are enlarged secondary follicles with expanded mantle zones. And these mantle zones are slowly, slowly coming inside the germinal center and therefore it results in fragmentation of the germinal center. So it causes a disruption of the follicular dendritic meshwork. As you can see over here, CD21 stain will show you such disrupted follicular meshwork pattern. So this is what is called as a PTGC. What is this condition and why is it important? Because a small progression, a small proportion are known to progress to NLPHL, which is the 
nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is found to be associated with even pediatric marginal zone lymphoma and autoimmune lymphoma. These are the few conditions to which it may progress, but the treatment of PTGC is excisional biopsy and follow-up to detect early any lymphomatous change. And if at all you have a doubt of NLPHL or a follicular lymphoma, one can do IHC and look for the typical patterns to differentiate between these two conditions. Another case, this was a 50-year-old male who had pain in abdomen and on ultrasound there was an extensive abdominal lymphadenopathy. So a core needle biopsy was done to rule out lymphoma. Clinically, it was a suspected lymphoma. But on the core needle biopsy, we could see only reactive follicles. So clinically, it was not correlating because serum LDH was also elevated. So clinically, it was a strongly uh, pointer towards lymphoma. So we asked for an excisional node biopsy because the CNB picture was not correlating with the clinical and the serological picture. So a lymph node, uh, inguinal lymph node was sent to us and this showed widely spaced follicles with germinal centers and this intrafollicular area was expanded by a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. On higher power examination, we could see that some follicles showed multiple germinal centers like this and few follicles showed an onion skin type of uh, thickening of the mantle zone and the germinal center showed highly nice blood vessel inside the follicle. So we kept a provisional diagnosis of Castleman disease and advised an HHV-8 stain. Meanwhile, we did the uh, more markers on the IHC. So we could see follicles which had germinal centers and some did not have germinal centers. The CD20 stain was positive inside the uh, germinal centers, but the paracortical area was negative. BCL2, as you can see over here, was negative. BCL6 and CD10 was positive. CD23, some follicles showed a tight clusters of dendritic cells with the follicle uh, meshwork intact, but some cells, uh, some follicles showed disruptive dendritic networks. And we did an HHV-8 stain from outside, which showed HHV-8 positive plasma blast or cells, which were outside the uh, follicle, just outside the follicle. So this was HHV-8 type of, uh, positive type of Castleman disease. Now Castleman disease is classified into three types, highly invascular type, plasma cell HHV negative type, and plasma cell HHV positive type. Highline vascular is usually unicentric. If it is asymptomatic, no treatment is advised. But if it is causing symptoms, then excision is the treatment of choice. Its importance is its potential to progress into follicular dendritic cell sarcoma. Plasma cell uh, type of Castleman disease is uh, difficult to treat because it needs systemic treatment in the form of steroids or rituximab. Moreover, if it is HHV posit HHV8 positive, then there is a potential to develop into HHV8 positive dif diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So that is the entity of Castleman disease. Coming to another type of follicular hyperplasia, which we saw in a case was that this was a young male who was seropositive, HIV positive, and he had generalized lymphadenopathy along with loss of weight and fever. So suspecting that this patient may have lymphoma, a biopsy was done, which showed such large follicles with very irregular germinal centers in the lymph node biopsy. So this was a type of florid follicular hyperplasia in a, seen in a HIV positive uh, individual. And on IHC, these were CD20 positive follicles composed of B cells. CD3 was negative inside the follicles and BCL2 was also negative, confirming that they are uh, reactive nature. So we signed it out as florid follicular hyperplasia associated with HIV. Later, these follicles can show follicular involution 
compatible with the lymphoid depletion stage. And these individuals having been immunocompromised can develop other infections like Epstein-Barr virus infection, HHV-8 infection, and moreover, HIV-associated lymphomas can also occur in these patients. Coming to the paracortical region, which is composed of T cells, which show a positivity for the T cell markers like CD3, as you can see over here. BCL2 is also positive in T cells. You can see the paracortical T cells, follicular helper cells inside the germinal center and few T cells scattered in the mantle zone also. Both CD4 and CD8 are expressed because these T zones are composed of both helper type and cytotoxic type of lymph uh, lymphocytes, but CD4 are always more in a reactive uh, lymph node than the CD8 type of cells. Another characteristic feature of a paracortical zone is the high endothelial venules. These are the venules where the T lymphocytes go inside the lymph node. So these are very uh, characteristic feature of a paracortical region and we always see such high endothelial venules inside the paracortical region. Coming to paracortical hyperplasia, which is a type of less common type of response pattern to some sort of uh, infections, especially viral infection and Epstein-Barr virus infection causing such type of hi uh, hyperplasia in the paracortical region is gaining wide importance. Post-vaccinal or drug-induced lymphadenopathy can also show paracortical type of hyperplasia and dermatopathic lymphadenitis is another condition which shows paracortical hyperplasia. And a recently diagnosed, a recently denoted entity called as IgG4 related sclerosing disease may show lymphadenopathy in many cases. And if you see the slide under the microscope, you will see such type of paracortical hyperplasia in this condition also. We are not very much familiar with uh, paracortical hyperplasia uh, reactive patterns. So I'll be uh, discussing what is given in the literature very shortly. Epstein-Barr virus is gaining a lot of importance. You will see a lot of literature in the Western uh, uh, publications concerning EBV-associated lymphoproliferative disorders. Epstein-Barr virus causes many reactive lymphoid proliferations, which have either minimal or no malignant potential. An example of this is the infectious mononucleosis. Then it can also cause reactive proliferations which have a certain malignant potential. And these are such conditions. Uh, we have not really seen any of them. Then there are EBV associated B cell lymphoproliferative disorders, which consist of many types of lymphomas, notably Hodgkin's lymphoma, Burkitt's lymphoma, DLBL associated with EBV and so on. Then EBV can also cause T NK cell lymphoproliferative disorders. Notable amongst them are the AITL and the follicular T cell lymphoma and systemic EBV positive T cell lymphoma of childhood and some more. And then EBV can also be associated with certain immunodeficiency disorders like HIV related lymphoproliferative disorders and other iatrogenic immunodeficiency associated lymphoproliferative disorders. What is more important is all these conditions are called as post-transplant or immunodeficiency associated EBV disorders and they are increasingly found in all the Western literature. We have not yet experienced it ourselves. What will the commonest EBV uh, reactive uh, condition is infectious mononucleosis and what will we see here are the hyperplastic follicles as well as a very expanded paracortex and this paracortex will show lots of lymphocytes, plasma cells and both B and T immunoblast as EBV results in proliferation of both B as well as T cells and since these are immunoblasts they will be showing CD30 positivity. And if you want to visualize the EBV, we have two uh, stains. One is the nuclear stain, RNA stain, which is called as EBER. And it has to be looked with in situ hybridization techniques. And we can also see the cytoplasmic EBV in the form of 
IHC, EBV, LMP positivity. Coming to another condition which is increasingly uh, discussed in literature is the IgG4 related lymphadenopathy. This is a recently described entity in 2003. It is a fibroinflammatory disease and presents usually with autoimmune pancreatitis or other uh, visceral involvement. 80% of patients with autoimmune pancreatitis show lymphadenopathy, usually in the form of multifocal generalized lymphadenopathy, and it can occur in a known patient or it can be an initial presenting manifestation of the disease. So differential diagnosis will include lymphoma, metastasis, as well as uh, multicentric Castleman disease. And what is the most important point is, even though it is an autoimmune disorder and an inflammatory disorder, LDH levels are most of the times normal. What is raised is the serum levels of IgG4. G4 is a type of immunoglobulin which is uh, very small uh, quantities are present normally, but then in this condition, they are very much raised along with polyclonal hypergammaglobulinemia of the G type, and there is an elevation of the ESR itself. When we see a lymph node of IgG4 related lymphadenopathy, we can see one of the five patterns Castleman disease like pattern, which is follicular hyperplasia type, along with paracortical hyperplasia. Then there would be Follicular hyperplasia, only a reactive type of, uh, this is second pattern. Third is an intrafollicular plasma cytosis and immunoblast pattern. This is called as pattern three. There can be a PTGC-like pattern, which is type four. And then there is a pseudotumor-like pattern, which is not very common, which is called as pattern five. So when we do the IgG4 stain, we can see the IgG4 positive plasma cells, which are polyclonal in nature. They are present in the interfollicular areas and in the follicular center compartments in all of these patterns. And that is how this IgG4 related lymphadenopathy is diagnosed. So what I want to emphasize is every lymphadenopathy is not a lymphoma and it is very, very important for a pathologist to differentiate between the two because it will make a very a significant difference to the patient's life and to the clinician who is treating this patient. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Meghe Medical College team pathology and especially Dr. Pratibha Madam to, who had reposed our, her faith in our staff members to give a, a, a CME on lymphomas. Thank you so much. He was president of Minerva Association of Pathologists and Microbiologists in the year 2010 or the 1920s. He has an experience of 31 years in the field of pathology and pathology. The session will be chaired by Dr. Umar Sir. Dr. Kishore Deshpande Sir, please.
Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Kishor Deshpande, and topic for today's discussion is role of immunophenotyping in diagnosis of chronic lymphoproliferative disorders or non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, by definition, the CLPDs are the disorders characterized by abnormal proliferation of lymphocytes into monoclonal population. Now, as we all know that lymphocytes are present in peripheral blood, bone marrow aspiration or bone marrow, lymph node, and lymphoid aggregates all over the different organs of the body. So practically lymphoma can occur anywhere in the body. So naturally, the mainstay of the diagnosis of lymphoma is histopathology and immunohistochemistry. And flow, flow cytometry comes in the picture when bone marrow is involved or peripheral blood shows lymphocytosis. Of course, we can do flow cytometry or immunophenotyping on the samples from FNAC of lymph node or in body, uh, body cavity fluids or even the lymph node biopsy when we get the fresh lymph node. Of course, we also tried these specimens at NCI, but right now we are not doing much frequently immunophenotyping on lymph node aspirate for different reasons. Now, if you will see the recent WHO classification of lymphomas or CLPDs, you will see it's a very long list. It is basically divided on the basis of cell of involvement, that is whether it is B, T lymphocytes or NK cells, then morphology, immunohistochemistry, molecular diagnosis, and the site of involvement. So it's a long list. Many people ask whether it is really important to have such a long list. And my answer is yes, because though right now there are not different protocols are not available for different kinds of lymphomas, but in the future, definitely these lymphoma will have different treatment protocols and particularly in the era of immunotherapy. So it is definitely important to a pathologist who is reporting lymphoma to know all these kinds of lymphomas. So this is a list. Apart from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you have got Hodgkin's disease, immunodeficiency associated with lymphoproliferative disorders, then histiocytic and dendritic cell neoplasms. Now, since many students are attending this, I would like to say, or I would like to emphasize that though we will be discussing many ancillary techniques here, the very important thing in the diagnosis of lymphoma or any other pathology is morphology. Unless you are very much perfect in morphology, you can't take the help of these ancillary techniques. And so you have to know your morphology first before. And uh, similarly, not all pathologists will be lucky to have these ancillary techniques at hand to get help from them. So you will have to refer these specimen to different referral centers. And for that also, morphology is must. Many times we get a... Uh, patient who is uh, labeled as chronic myeloid leukemia and he is actually or she is actually a patient of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and vice versa. So basically first very important thing is morphology. For example, small cell with scanty cytoplasm are seen in CLL, mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma or low grade follicular lymphoma. And even you can get blastic picture or blastic type of cells in chronic lymphoproliferative disorder. So you should be aware about all this morphology. Similarly, there are some biochemical parameters which can help in diagnosis. And coming to the role of flow cytometry, first is the to assess the clonality. Now you all know that IgH gene rearrangement is supposed to be the gold standard to consider monoclonality of the cells. But as far as flow cytometry is concerned, we take the help of light chain restriction to call that particular cell 
monoclonal cell of course along with the other parameters for example you know that peripheral normal peripheral blood is having almost 70 to 85 percent t lymphocytes if there is a lymphocytosis and if they are showing b markers positive naturally you are dealing with the lympho or chronic lymphoproliferative disorders along with that if there is a right chain restrictions you are sure that you are de do, do, dealing with some of the chronic lymphoproliferative disorder then the after deciding monoclonality you come to the diagnosis then staging of lymphomas if uh, in a case of known case of a lymphoma if bone marrow is showing mild lymphocytosis and if you run that sample on flow cytometer and you can show that those cells are monoclonal and they resemble in immunophenotyping uh, to the lymph node biopsy cells then you can show that marrow is involved then to know the prognostic marker for example cd38 and zap70 these are considered markers with a bad prognosis then detection of target molecules for example anti cd20 drugs are available that is called as rituximab similarly anti cd30 brentuximab these drugs are available so if you can show that these markers are positive you can take help of these drugs like uh, acute uh, leukemia here in also in uh, CLPDs, we can do minimal residual studies, minimal residual disease study with the help of flow cytometry. Now, what are the samples we can uh, run on the flow cytometer? Peripheral blood, bone marrow, body cavity fluids, needle aspirate, and biopsy from lymph node and spleen and skin. For blood and marrow, you have to send sample in EDTA or in heparin. Now, since again, many students are there, I will just show a few slides regarding what is flow cytometry. Now, flow cytometry word itself explains the technique. It is a measurement of the cells when they are flowing. Why we are measuring the cells when they are flowing? Because our samples are liquid. With the help of flow cytometry, we can measure both intrinsic as well as existing extrinsic properties of the cells while they are moving. This use the principle of hydrodynamic technique when two liquids are moving in the same direction at different pressures they will not get mixed so here you can see this is the core which is of the wbc's and it is surrounded by uh, sheath fluid so practically you can measure single cell when it is flowing it is bombarded with the help of a laser beam and naturally the light will get scattered now the scattering of light occurs in forward direction as well as all around the cell so the light which is getting scattered in the forward direction is called as forward scattered and light which is scattering all through the cell all all around the cell is called as a side scatter now side scatter in flow cytometer is measured at 90 degree so forward scatter denotes the size of the cells if the forward scatter is larger you can say that this cell is larger or if forward scatter is more you can say uh, less you can say this particular cell is a small cell similarly if the cells is having cell is having more granules the side scatter will be more and so uh, flow cytometer tells us about size of the cell granularity of the cell and on that we have to this is a big one disadvantage of the flow cytometer that we can't see the architecture if we are getting a lymph node biopsy on histopathology you can see the complete architecture you can see the follicles you can see the germinal center that is not possible in flow cytometry so we have to rely on some other parameters and with the help of size and granularity we can identify which cell we are dealing with and then there are different fluorochrome stag antibodies which will help us and show that which particular antigen is expressed by that particular cell so lastly we get this kind of picture here you can see these are the granulocytes they are having large size scatter and they are having lot forward scatter so they are granular cells with the large size and here are the lymphocytes they are having small size and no granules or very scanty granules now what is the problem with this forward scattered side scatter plot is that here this is the rbc debris though we are lysing the rbcs at the beginning of the pro uh, uh, procedure we can still have some rbc debris and even the blast will come in this region some 
so if we consider forward scatter and side scatter plot there could be a mixture of rbc debris lymphocyte and blast but we need the exact percentage so we do what is called as cd45 gating now here this is with the help of cd45 the brightest cd45 positive cells are lymphocytes so these are the lymphocytes and rbc debris will come here and the blast will come here some of the blast can be negative for cd45 particular in bll and some tall blast can be as bright as lymphocytes but basically with the help of this we can uh, identify which cell we are dealing with then i have i am going to show you the uh, a prototype example of normal b cell maturation all this is true for t cell maturation myelite cell maturation that there are different stages as you know from immature cells to mature cells and at different stages different antigens are expressed by the particular cells some of the antigens they are expressed throughout the stage, all the stages of development and they are called as pan markers for example in b cell it is uh, cd19 which is called as pan b marker you can see cd19 is expressing immature cell as well as in a mature cell so if you know that which antigens are present at which stage and if you can uh, with the help of flow cytometry if you can show that which antigen is expressed by that particular cell you can know which cell you are dealing with now again with the help of flow cytometry you Uh, differentiate the cell b cell t cell marker now these are the different antibodies this is a panel of antibody we have to use and these are the different antibodies which we are using at nci to differentiate between b t and nk cells all these uh, markers they are for b cells and these are for t cells we identify the abnormal mature b lymphocytes that is done by immunoglobulin light chain restriction and aberrant anti antigen expression similarly the intensity of the antigen expression is also seen to know what kind of cell we are dealing with for example cd20 cd22 these markers are expressed dimly by the lymphocytes of cll but they can be very bright in hairy cell leukemia while dealing with uh, b cell neoplasm we see expression of cd5 and cd10 mainly first to differentiate do you know that cd5 is a t cell marker but it is express along with the b cell markers for example cd19 and also there is a co expression of cd23 or cd200 in case of cll sll in case of mantle cd5 is positive but cd23 is negative so here with the help of these markers we can differentiate five positive 10 negative mostly cll mantle it can be lymphoplasmacytic or it can be dlbcl then five positive 10 positive mostly it is dlbcl or follicular five negative 10 positive most of the time it is follicular lymphoma which we are dealing with then five negative 10 negative it is a mantle cell a marginal zone lymphoma or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma it can be hairy cell of course there are other markers which will be positive for example cd103 cd25 in hairy cell so with the help of this we can come to a particular diagnosis now again this is also a prototype example i am showing a typical cll now cll as i have already told you will typically express cd19 5 and 200 and 23 but there can be sometime cd5 can be negative cd23 can be negative fmc7 which is usually negative in cll can be positive in um, atypical cll then 11c can be positive 79b can be positive and surface immunoglobulin as i told you they are usually expressed dimly in cll but you can get strong positivity in case of such a discrepancy we have to take help of molecular uh, test to come to diagnosis similarly in case of t uh, clpds as you all know cd4 are t helper cells cd4 uh, cd8 positive cells are t suppressor cells and in mature lymphocyte they are not co express but if we see a patient with lymphocytosis having co expression of cd4 cd8 or if 
both are negative or if one is positive one is negative then there are different types of lymphomas which you can diagnose here is a list i won't go in details of them now limitation of flow limitations of flow cytometry it requires fresh and unfixed tissue for analysis when reactive cells are more than neoplastic particularly if you are doing it on the lymph node aspirate and if you are getting more number of reactive cells than neoplastic cells you can have a problem in diagnosis then dilution of the sample most of the time we get the sample which is contaminated or which is diluted with the peripheral blood again the if number of cells of lymphoma cells are if very low you find it is problematic to report on that then cannot get follicular lymphoma naturally because we are not seeing the architecture of the lymph node and cost so take home message as far as flow cytometry in lymphoma is concerned do morphology is gold standard immunophenotyping is essential for subtyping targeted therapy is possible and genotyping or molecular studies may need may be needed for diagnosis especially when there is some discrepancy in the markers expression now i will show you some cases uh, 68 year old male generalized lymphadenopathy hepatosplenomegaly peripheral blood shows 75 70% lymphocytes marrow showed 50% lymphocytes and on flow cytometry it showed the co expression of 19523 cd22 was weak there was kappa restriction but it was but it was weakly expressed so naturally the diagnosis was chronic lymphocytic leukemia then 65 year old female presented with lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly tlc was 40000 platelets were 35000 and 80% atypical lymphoid cells seen flow cytometry analysis so morphological diagnosis was acute leukemia probably lymphoblastic because they were uh, the cell 80% cells were looking like a uh, like blasts on flow cytometry analysis cd45 was very bright so naturally we thought that we are probably not doing with uh, acute leukemia and then we got co expression of cd19 and 5 23 was negative cd200 was negative so our diagnosis was mantle cell lymphoma blastic variant then 20 year old female presented with fever off and on and cough weight loss loss of appetite hematuria bleeding pr bleeding gums and pain in abdomen on examination she showed gross pallor huge splenomegaly and hepatomegaly but there was no lymphadenopathy ct thorax shows uh, showed diffuse ground glass opacities involving bilateral lung fields and mild bilateral pleural effusion usg abdomen again showed hepatosplenomegaly Her hemoglobin was six, TLC was forty-two thousand, platelets were one lakh thirty thousand, and DLC showed sixty percent blast. So again, our diagnosis was acute leukemia. But on flow cytometry analysis, these cells express very bright CD forty-five. So naturally, we thought we are not dealing with the acute leukemia. And further, they showed expression of CD two, three, cyto CD three, CD seven, CD thirty-eight, CD fifty-six, CD seventy-three, and PCR gamma delta. but other t cell marker for example cd1 a which is a marker of immature t cell cd4 cd8 cd5 all they were negative so we made the diagnosis of hepatosplenic t cell lymphoma with leukemic conversion then one interesting case this is last case a 40 year old female presented with hemoglobin of 11.7 tlc was 15700 and she showed lymphocytosis with 70% lymphocytes but platelet count was 150000 and there was no organomegaly on flow cytometry analysis it showed 45% lymphocytes and 25% monocytes and this lymphocyte shows showed increase in the cd8 positive cells so cd4 to cd8 ratio was reverse we thought probably because otherwise clinically also she was um, well and her gc was fair and uh, we thought probably we are dealing with viral infection so we took the wait and watch uh, wait and watch approach and we asked her to repeat cbc after two weeks which was perfectly normal at ns at ncri till now we have done 45 cases on flow cytometry of course there are many lymphoma cases which we are diagnosed with the help of uh, lymph node biopsy isc 
out of which CLL were 21 cases. One case was deemed CD5 expressing. Uh, then B CLPDs were 12. Mental lymphoma, mental cell lymphoma were seven. Three were T CLPDs. One was hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma, and one was viral. Thank you. Use one CD. Uh, use one uh, needles, uh, and apart from it, you can use consumables. So. While doing. Thank you, sir, for an enlightening talk. Moving to the next section, may I request Dr. Radhika Pagiman, Senior Consultant, Department of Pathology, National Cancer Institute, to illuminate us on topic demystifying the diagnosis of common subtypes of B cell non Hodgkin's lymphomas, an integrated approach. She has 20 years of experience in pathology. She is a surgical pathologist with the experience in frozen section and immunohistochemistry. She has multiple publications in international journal. This session will be chaired by Dr. Umap Sir. Dr. Pagingam, please. Good afternoon, everyone. For kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Pratibha Davande, Madam, and Dr. Gode, sir, for arranging CNE on lymphoma because so many updates have come up in lymphoma, and this CNE was very much needed. I'm going to talk on demystifying the diagnosis of common subtypes of BNHL, an integrated approach. And I must say that teamwork makes the dream work, and the dream is to cure lymphoma. This is roadmap to my talk. I have kept it simple and application based for you. I will build up from basics to your insights in diagnosis and hope we get over the lymphoma phobia. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is heterogeneous group of hematolymphoid malignancies. It is characterized by progressive monoclonal proliferation of lymphocytes. BNHL constitute about 85% and it is further subtyped into precursor B and mature B type. There are four pillars of integrated diagnosis, clinical radiological characteristics, morphology gives us differential diagnosis, immunohistochemistry confirms the diagnosis and gives us prognosis and predictive markers. Molecular profiling is the fourth and new pillar in lymphoma diagnosis. Different tumor biologies are to be treated differently and hence molecular subtyping is necessary in the era of molecular medicine. This is the journey of B lymphocyte from bone marrow to lymph node, which we are aware of. Now, regarding lymphomagenesis, one must note that these are the contributing factors of molecular events which transform lymphoid cell into malignant lymphocyte. And these neoplastic cells get arrested at various stages of differentiation. To keep it simple, when naive lymphocyte gets out of bone marrow and settles in the mantle zone of lymphocyte, if oncogenic events have occurred, it will convert into mantle cell lymphoma. Similarly, follicular B blast will give rise to bucket lymphoma, centroblast will give rise to diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma will arise from centrocyte. This is important to know because on this basis, immunophenotype of lymphoma is expressed. After seeing these basics, let us see algorithmic evaluation of lymphoma. Everything starts with biopsy. See whether it is inadequate or adequate. If it is adequate, see whether it is neoplastic or reactive. If neoplastic, see whether it is non-lymphoid malignancy or lymphoma. If it is lymphoma, see on microscopy whether you found it to be non-Hodgkin lymphoma or Hodgkin lymphoma. If non-Hodgkin, see the size of cell, whether small or large, see the nucleus, whether it is immature and mature, and further subtyping needs immunohistochemistry. Right diagnosis needs right tissue. So advised biopsy if concert material is non-diagnostic or inadequate. 
whole node exponential biopsy is preferred, but we are getting so many core biopsies that are indicated in retroperitoneal lymph nodes and mediastinal lymph nodes. And when patient is not fit to undergo anesthesia, but it should be treated as plan B whenever whole node excisional biopsy is possible, it has to be done. Make clinicians aware of limitations of core biopsy. Tissue is always the issue and please try it um, for subsequent evaluation by immunohistochemistry and molecular testing. So the practical tip is divide your multiple cores into multiple blocks so that tissue can be triaged. But what is the pitfall of this core biopsy? Example is follicular lymphoma. See, these are the neoplastic follicles and our middle has entered in between the follicles and that will give us diffuse area. We will not be able to see follicular pattern. We will not be able to document transformation of follicular lymphoma to DLBCL. We will not be able to grade follicular lymphoma because minimum 10 follicles are necessary uh, to give grading of follicular lymphoma. Lymphoma and of course, composite lymphoma is not core biopsy diagnosis. This should be told to clinician clearly. Now, what are the clinical inputs we need for from clinician? This is a long list, and I'm not going to read it for you. Radiologists see the larger picture. Please remember this point and always ask about treatment history because if patient is treated with rituximab in previously diagnosed patient, and if you are going to diagnose relapse, then you must know this history because CD20 will be negative in such cases and you'll have to put CD79A. If primary diagnosis is yet to be done and patient has received steroids, then it also changes the morphology. So lymphoma is not spot diagnosis and it has to be uh, inter interpreted against clinical context. Now, age guides us. How does age guides us? Because there are certain lymphomas which are common in childhood, like lymphoblastic lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, anaplastic larcel lymphoma. If patient is of old age, then DLBCL, follicular lymphoma, mantle, marginal, CLL, SLL, these are the common subtypes. Sight also rings the bell. If you're getting biopsy from mediastinum, think of a primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma. If it's a biopsy from GI tract, think of myeltoma and DLBCL. Skin, usually we say that it's a feature of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, but DLBCL also uh, involves uh, skin, splin, splenic marginal zone. So sight rings the bell. After this clinical input, I like to go in for quick basics for understanding lymphoma. Know the normal to spot the abnormal. This is a normal histology and see the beautiful compartments of lymph node. Anatomical compartments are cortex, follicles, which, are, which is made up of follicles, then there is paracortex, medulla inside, and concentrate on this germinal center and try to appreciate these zones because then we'll be able to understand mantle zone pattern and marginal zone pattern. So whenever you are doing routine reporting, Try to interpret lymph nodes in head neck tray because that shows beautiful mantle cell, which is compressed and dense blue. And if you are reporting a GI tray, try to appreciate marginal zone, which has clear cytoplasm. And marginal zone you usually don't see, it is seen in uh, lymph node, but try to see it. After that, this is the uh, this is the picture of normal lymph node and this is the picture down versus the uh, lymph node involved by lymphoma. Now, there is a set pattern to examine lymph node. Always start with compartmental approach. Uh, see whether the compartments are identifiable or not. By the uh, size of section, we will be able to say that whether the lymph node is enlarged or of normal size. See capsule, which is usually thin. You can see perineural infiltration. Subcapsular sinus is usually obliterated and architecture. Uh, means whether the lymph node is effaced architecture or it's showing partial effacement. 
By effacement of architecture, you mean that you cannot assign compartments to that particular lymph node. After this is done, you have to do pattern analysis, then go to high power and see cytomorphology and mention about a company granuloma. So what are the patterns which are giving basic clues to us? This, these are follicular pattern, nodular pattern, and diffuse pattern. The differential diagnosis of follicular pattern is follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and marginal cell lymphoma. Nodular pattern is seen in mantle cell lymphoma, nodular sclerosis in Hodgkin lymphoma, and NLPHL. CLL also can show nodular pattern, and diffuse pattern is seen in GLBCL, MCL, and PTCL. So what is the difference between follicular pattern and nodular pattern? Follicular pattern is reminiscent with reactive follicle. Nodular pattern is diffuse nodules and margins are indistinct. So size also matters. Once you have understood the pattern, go to high power and see the size. They can be small lymphocyte, intermediate size or large lymphoid cells. And what is the differential diagnosis? Small lymphocytes are seen in SLL, MCL, and NZL. Centrocyte like cells are seen in follicular lymphoma, mantle, marginal. Blastoid cells, blast like cells are seen in lymphoblastic lymphoma, blastoid man mantle, and myeloid sarcoma. This is very important to remember because. All of us know that on peripheral smear, we give differentials of ALL and AML. But somehow in tissue, blastoid variant of myeloid sarcoma doesn't come to our, our mind. But this is very important because this particular entity will give all lymphoid markers negative and you will have to put MPO and CD117 to diagnose blastic variant of myeloid sarcoma. If the cells are large, Think of DLBCL, pleomorphic mantle, and PTCL. If they are medium size, it has to be Burkitt's. So small cells are seen and you want to prepare ISC panel. It can be done in two ways. Either you can go in two steps, primary and secondary panel, or you can go in one go. See, most common lymphoma is DNHL. So this was the panel put for small cells. CD3 is linear specific for T cells, CD20 for B cells, CD10 is germinal center marker, CD5 is T cell origin, 5 and 23 is seen in CLL, cycling D1 and SOX11 are seen in mantle cell, BCL6 is again germinal center marker, BCL2 and KI67 are prognostic. K67 index is never more than 20% in low-grade lymphomas. But by chance, if it is documented, then you must tell your clinician that on morphology, it is small cell low-grade lymphoma with high proliferative index because then clinically aggressive course is anticipatory. Whenever you are seeing large cells, again, CD3 for D cell lineage, 20 for B cell lineage, 10 BCL6 and MUM1 for subtyping in GCB and ADC type, BCL2 and CMIC for double expression, CD5 for uh, T cell lineage. ISC panels are given in many textbooks, many tables, but you have to customize and make your own panel. So, before interpretation of uh, immunohistochemistry, just uh, let us see about immunohistology. So immunohistology is uh, beautifully depicted in this slide. Brown revolution is all about location, location, and location. This is cortex, cortex of lymph node showing beads hole. And this is the paracortex showing T cell compartment. This is dendritic cell meshwork, and this is very useful in grading of follicular lymphoma, which show different patterns like expansile, presentric, and broken. Diffuse infiltrate, if it is there in lymph node, no meshworks are seen. So, after saying the basics of immunohistology, I would Try to explain this WHO new chart to you. It's slightly complicated, but I'll try to make it simple. So morphology is not going anywhere. You are doing morphology, even if you're typing, fish and karyotype is new entrant. And then WHO classification is based on all three. If the morphology is of Burkitt lymphoma, you cannot give it directly of like Burkitt lymphoma. 
what we normally do in proper clinical context. If morphology of Burkitt's is C, and on immunohistochemistry, 10, 22, BCL6 is positive, MIC is expressed on IHC, and K67 is 100%. We commit Burkitt. But now the recommendation is you must do facial karyotyping because on this morphology, if 11Q aberration without mid break is seen, you have to label it as Burkitt like lymphoma with 11Q aberration. And if mid translocation is documented with simple karyotype, then it is Burkitt's lymphoma. If the morphology is intermediate between Burkitt lymphoma and DLBCL, then there are many options. If MIC and BCL2 and BCL6 arrangement is seen, then it becomes high grade B lymphoma with double hits. If the double hits are not seen, then it becomes high grade B cell lymphoma NOS. Now about DLBCL. DLBCL morphology can also show this MIC, BCL2 and BCL6 rearrangement. In that case, it is to be labeled as high grade B cell lymphoma double it. And if it is not seen, DLB cell is subtyped into GCB and ABC type. Sometimes blastoid morphology is seen, which is TDT negative, cycling D1 negative, there are no hits. So this category is labeled as high grade B cell lymphoma NOS. So, what are the guidelines for integrated diagnosis of DLB cell? Standard morphology, ISC, and molecular techniques has to be done. Cell of origin subtype is mandatory because distinction between GCB and ABC will give us prognosis. GCB has better prognosis than ABC. Now, immunohistochemistry for MIC and BCL2 is required, and FISH analysis is advised in all the cases of German and center B cell type. Mutation analysis and the diagnosis will influence treatment, and ibrutinib is recommended for relapsed ABC DLBCL. DLBCL is potentially curable lymphoma, and prognosis differs as per cell of origin subtype. Many a times, after giving diagnosis of DLBCL, clinicians give us feedback that patient is not responding as expected. So these are the cases which should be subjected to mutation analysis and I'm sure they will document double hit or triple hit. Now, um, I was talking about ABC and GCB and how is it, it is to be done. It is done by Hans algorithm. What is Hans algorithm? It is a surrogate for gene expression profiling and concordance of this algorithm with GP is 86%. Above the Hans algorithm in the list is Visco Young algorithm, which uses Fox P1, but all over the world, Hans is acceptable. So always use Hans algorithm and give the subtyping. What is it all about? It includes three uh, immunohistochemistry markers, CD10, BCL6, and MUM1. If CD10 is positive, which is germinal center marker, it straight away becomes GCB type. But if it is negative, then see what is the status of BCL6. If it is negative, then germinal center origin is ruled out and it becomes non-germinal center uh, B cell type. But if B cell 6 is positive, you have to put MUM1. And if MUM1 becomes positive, it is diagnostic of non-GCB. BCL6 positive and MUM1 negative is still germinal center B cell origin because BCL6 is germinal center marker. So we'll come to case scenarios after this, after seeing these basic things. This was eight-year-old male with large retroperitoneal mass with skeletal and CNS involvement and coronary biopsy from retroperitoneal mass was received. So this was large B lymphoma type cells. So immunohistochemistry was done and it was CD20 positive, BCL6 positive, MUM1 positive, CMIC positive, BCL2 expressed and MIP1 index was 80%. So immunonegativity was seen in CD10, CD3 and CD5. That is why the diagnosis of diffuse large B cell lymphoma ABC type triple expressor was given. 
the patient was having CNS involvement and CNS CSF cytology showed malignant lymphoid cells. So here was the role of cytology in CSF in uh, lymphoma. So I'm telling you about positivity of MIG-BCL to BCL6, but there are uh, recommended cutoffs. Like you say CMIG is positive when it is 40% for BCL2 and BCL6, the cutoff is 50%. And for MUM1, the cutoff is 80%. So what is this double hit and double expressor? And what is the difference? When we use the term double hit, we are using it after molecular testing and two recurrent chromosomal breakpoint aberrations are seen. MIC is mandatory, MIC is central, along with it BCL2 and BCL6 or both can be seen. If only BCL2 and BCL6 are seen, don't call it as double hit lymphoma. This double hit is commonly seen in GCB type, it has got bad prognosis and it is treated aggressively. By double expressor, we mean that it is protein expression by immunohistochemistry. It is immunohistochemistry terminology and co-expression of BCL2 CMIC on ILC is seen. The prognosis is intermediate between GLBCL NOS and double hit lymphoma. So it is very mandatory to differentiate the subtypes. Now, what is biomarker testing used in GLBCL? Cytogenetics. Hybrid B cell lymphoma with MIG B cell 2 and or B cell C makes it hybrid B cell lymphoma and not GLBCL. Double expressor, we have seen MIG B cell 2. What is the therapy option? CD20, if positive, rituximab is given. CD30 is an option in resistant cases. If, uh, if we have to give brentuximab, C for CD30 positivity, that is also an option. Either can be done and P53 overexpression um, is indicative of poorer prognosis. Now, these are the other distinctive subtypes of uh, aggressive B cell lymphoma, and it is not possible to cover all this. But there are certain interesting conditions like primary DLBCL of central nervous system and intravascular large B cell lymphoma, which we might cover in subsequent uh, CAEs. This was the case scenario number one, 12 year old male, isolated cervical lymph node, large node. So FNSC was advised suspecting tuberculosis, but there was a typical lymphoproliferation. So excision was done on histopathology. There was follicular pattern histology and favoring follicular lymphoma, but in young age, differential diagnosis of follicular uh, hyperplasia was kept and IC was run and interestingly BCL2 was negative. BCL2 we know that it is always positive in adult follicular lymphoma but here it was negative. So the second marker which is diagnostic of pediatric follicular lymphoma FOXP1 is applied and it was strong and diffuse positive. Next generation sequencing can be done here to show TNF RSF protein mutation because fish is always negative for translocation 14 and 18. Surgical excision is the choice of treatment, it is the treatment. So pediatric type follicular lymphoma is seen in young patients, head neck side, grade three morphology, K67 is always high, 1P36 loss can be seen, but prognosis is favorable. Follicular neoplasia in C2 is another terminology, newer terminology for follicular lymphoma in C2, where occasional follicles show BCL2 positivity. Nodal architecture is intact. This is incidental finding. Follicles are of normal size and they are not to be treated. So um, it, is, it is better to know this entity because at times it can be associated with lymphoma at other sites and the patient is kept on follow-up. So I have certain stories to tell you about integrated approach, how it helped our team and our patients. Left supraclavicular lymph node, the liporadiological diagnosis was lymphoma and what we saw in excisional whole node biopsy, clear cell morphology. So we asked initially, 
Is there something in stomach or somewhere? Is it metastatic carcinoma? They said, no, there's nothing. It has to be lymphoma, um, our point of view. But we said we cannot commit lymphoma and clear cell morphology. Let's apply ILC. And ILC confirmed it to be DABCL ABC type. Second case was inguinal lymph node excision. It was reactive, absolutely no differential diagnosis on morphology. In the meantime, which it was VIP, PET CT was done done and they said organomegaly is there it is lymphoma all nodes are involved we represented we asked about the inguinal lymph node status of contralateral side and same group. they said no they are showing no metabolic activity so we committed we reported that uh, this lymph node is not involved by lymphoma in the proper context of clinical and radiological findings kindly advise lymph node excision and biopsy from lymph node showing highest metabolic activity so this has got medical legal importance because if PET is saying that he is having lymphoma and if you are reporting negative biopsy, whatever you tell patient that it is not representative, he doesn't understand. He says that you, are, you have missed the diagnosis. So add comment and state that this particular submitted lymph node is uninvolved and you need metabolically active lymph node. This was retroperitoneal lymph node, diagnosis query lymphoma, morphology reactive, Beautiful reactive cores, tangible body macrophages were also documented. So we said it is not lymphoma. So PET review was done and a PET consultant said that there is something suspicious uptake in pancreas. So laparoscopic biopsy of mold was done and it was turned out to be metastatic carcinoma. This was left leg mass. Clinical radiologically, they said looks like benign. On morphology, we said we are seeing spindle cell, but slight OTPI is there. We need to apply immunohistochemistry. In the meantime, uh, they did the uh, PET CT, and again came the feedback that uh, it has to be lymphoreticular malignancy. Generalized lymphadenopathy is there. On spindle morphology, we exhausted all the panel of uh, spindle cell uh, immunohistochemistry profile and we put 45. It came positive. Then the plan and B was put and diagnosis of DLBC spindle cell variant was given. Could that CD45 comes positive, but here is a caveat because CD45 can be negative in many of the lymphomas like plasma blastic lymphoma and LCL. So remember that integration is very important and must be done in every case. So the take home message is we are diagnostic oncologists and consultant to consultants. So, so please integrate all clinical, radiological, immunophilitical findings in your report. Right diagnosis starts with representative tissue properly fixed and processed. Try tissue for ILC and molecular testing. Integrate clinical radiological characteristics, morphology, and molecular profiling. And it's time to frame an integrated report. Thank you all. Thank you so much. While doing this procedure, uh... thank you, ma'am, for enlightening us with the knowledge and inspiring us. Now, let's have Dr. Chaitanya Munshi, sir, to share with us about laboratory monitoring of lymphoma patients with special reference to tumor axis syndrome. Sir, in the consulted Department of Laboratory Medicine at National Cancer Institute, Nagpur, he has completed a course from International School of Quality Management and is a certified clinical auditor. The session will be chaired by Dr. Mok Sir. I request Dr. Munchi Sir to start with the session, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Chaitanya Munshi, consultant at NCI Nagpur. My topic for today is laboratory monitoring of lymphoma patients with special reference to tumor lysis syndrome. Now, tumor lysis syndrome is a constellation of metabolic abnormalities which results when large number of tumor cells are lysed simultaneously, either spontaneously or because of chemotherapy. The reason why we have included tumor lysis syndrome in today's discussion is, number one, it is very commonly seen in hematological malignancies with potentially life-threatening complications. Number two, it is an oncologic emergency. 
and lab investigations and monitoring plays a very important role in the diagnosis, risk stratification, and management of tumor lysis syndrome. We'll be studying this topic under following headings. First, we'll see what exactly is tumor lysis syndrome, what are the different risk factors, and what is the pathogenesis of tumor lysis syndrome. Then we'll see how to diagnose tumor lysis syndrome, and we'll just see a brief overview about the treatment with an obvious bias towards lab investigations. So tumor lysis syndrome is a group of metabolic abnormalities that can occur as a complication during the treatment of metallurgical malignancies. Large number of tumor cells are lysed at the same time, releasing their contents into the bloodstream. The syndrome is characterized by a tetrad of abnormalities, that is hyperuricemia, means high uric acid levels, hyperkalemia, that is high potassium levels, hyperphosphatemia, that is high phosphorus level, and only one thing goes down, that is hypocalcemia, that is low calcium levels. And as I told you, it is an oncologic emergency. This is a pictorial representation of the tumor lysis syndrome in a patient of lymphoma. The cancer cells in the lympho lymphoma, on starting chemotherapy, they lyse, they break down, and all the intracellular contents are released in the blood. <clears throat> and you can see here, which gives rise to high levels of potassium, phosphorus, and uric acid, and low calcium levels, which in turn causes kidney injury and kidney failure, abnormal heart rhythms, or even cardiac arrest, muscle cramps, seizures, etc. We'll see subsequently how this happens. Now coming to the incidence, tumor lysis syndrome is most commonly observed in high-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients, particularly Burkitt's lymphoma and acute lymphoplastic leukemia. But TLS is also seen in other hematological and solid malignancies which share the characteristics of number one, high proliferative rate, and number two, high sensitivity to chemotherapy. So other hematological malignancies which can go for TLS are AML, CML, CLL, and low and intermediate grade non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And some solid tumors can also land up with TLS, like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, testicular tumors, neuroblastomas, and small cell carcinoma of the lung. This is the frequency of tumor lysis syndrome by tumor type. As you can see here, medulloblastoma, neuroblastoma, etc. There are only a few case reports available. While low-grade lymphoma, breast carcinoma, and small cell carcinoma of the lung, TLS is relatively uncommon, but it is most commonly seen in Burkitt's lymphoma, lymphoplastic lymphoma, and acute leukemia. Now, do all the patients of lymphoma land up with TLS? Obviously, no. There are certain risk factors which make them prone for TLS. So the risk factors for TLS depend on the several different characteristics of the patient, the type of cancer, and the type of chemotherapy used. So we can divide the risk factors into patient-related risk factors, tumor-related, and chemotherapy-related risk factors. So what are the tumor-related or cancer-related risk factors of TLS? First, when the tumor is bulky, bulky tumor means when the tumor mass is large, whenever we see an organ infiltration and bone marrow involvement, this constitutes bulky tumor. So whenever the tumor is bulky, it is at a high risk for TLS. Secondly, when the tumor has got a high proliferative rate, which we can see from the serum LDH levels, if they are very high, such tumors are also prone for TLS. And if the tumors are very chemosensitive, like Burkitt's lymphoma or lymphoplastic lymphoma, such tumors also land up with TLS. Then there are certain patient-related risk factors. If the patient is already a case of gout, that means his uric acid levels are high, if he's having chronic renal, renal insufficiency or CKD previously and hypertension, he is at a high risk for landing with TLS. And if the patient on presentation is having high uric acid levels, is dehydrated with diminished urine output and acidosis, such patients are most likely to land up with TLS. Now coming to the pathogenesis of TLS, a large number of tumor cells get lysed at the same time, releasing the intracellular contents. Now here you can see potassium is mainly an intracellular ion. Massive lysis of tumor cells leads to the spill of this potassium in blood causing hyperkalemia, which can cause cardiac arrhythmias and extreme muscular weakness. Like potassium, phosphorus also is a predominantly intracellular. Due to the lysis, when high amounts of phosphorus are released in the blood, it binds with the available calcium forming calcium phosphate crystals, 
which get deposited in the kidney parenchyma causing nephropathy so here calcium whatever calcium is available in the blood it gets used up because of this phosphorus and this leads to hypocalcemia so hypocalcemia per se is not a direct effect of tls but it is secondary to the hyperphosphatemia now coming to the fourth abnormality of the tetrad that is hypo hyperuricemia massive cell death and nuclear breakdown generates large quantities of nucleic acids of these the purines that is adenine and guanine get converted to uric acid via the purine degradation pathway okay now this uric acid is has got a very poor solubility and very low urinary excretion so this large amount of uric acids gets converted to monosodium uh, urate crystals which gets deposited in the kidney causing urate nephropathy now at this stage i would like to give you an important practical tip as i have stated earlier tls can occur either spontaneously or post chemotherapy now can we differentiate between the two based on the lab findings we can certainly get some clue in spontaneous tls we won't get hyperphosphatemia the theory is that whatever the phosphorus is generated during tumor lysis is reutilized by the viable tumor cells for their own growth hence levels of phosphorus do not rise once chemotherapy starts there are no more viable tumor cells to utilize this phosphorus hence the phosphorus levels start building up so in spontaneous tls you will get normal phosphorus levels and tls post chemotherapy you will get high phosphorus levels now these are the complications of tls as we have discussed high hyperkalemia will lead to cardiac arrhythmias and extreme muscular weakness hyperuricemia the uric acid crystals will get deposited in the kidney and cause acute renal failure similarly hyperphosphatemia it will combine with calcium forming hypocalcemia and forming calcium oxalate crystals which will damage the kidney again causing acute renal failure now how to diagnose tls see once the chemotherapy starts large number of biochemical parameters go haywire so when should we say that a patient is in tls now cairo and bishop these two gentlemen in 2004 gave a definition of tls and they in fact divided the tumor lysis syndrome into laboratory tls and clinical tls according to cairo and bishop if the uric acid levels are more than equal to 8 mg per dl the potassium is more than 6.0 or phosphorus is more than 4.5 or all these three are more than 25% in the show 25% more increase than the baseline and calcium if it is less than 7.0 or 25% decrease from baseline so two or more of this listed metabolic abnormalities now this is important are seen within 3 days before or 7 days after initiation of treatment this will constitute as laboratory tls now what is clinical tls if the laboratory tls is present plus any one of the following that is creatinine more than equal to 1. or 1.5 times the upper limit of normal patient is having cardiac arrhythmia or sudden death and seizure this will constitute clinical tls this is again same thing in a tabular form laboratory tls means all the four parameters show 25% change from the baseline and they occur within 3 days or 7 days after chemotherapy and clinical tls means laboratory tls plus plus one of the following that is high creatinine cardiac arrhythmias and seizures usually this is the usual progression of tls this first there is lysis leading to laboratory tls and leading to the clinical tls now in 2011 another gentleman by the name of howard proposed the refinement of the standard cairo bishop definition of tls accounting for the two limitations he said that two or more electrolyte laboratory abnormalities must be present simultaneously see for example patient on admission is having high uric acid levels hyperuricemia and after some days if he develops hypocalcemia maybe because of some unrelated reason like sepsis then that will not constitute tls the two abnormalities biochemical ab laboratory abnormalities should be present simultaneously to constitute tls and the secondly howard also removed the 25% change criteria from baseline he removed it from the definition and he added one more thing that if the patient is having symptomatic hypocalcemia 
it should constitute clinical tls now cairo and bishop also graded the tls from grade 0 to grade 5 this is mostly of clinical importance but i'll just give a brief mention here he used the parameters three parameters serum creatinine value and whether the patient is having cardiac arrhythmia or seizure uh, based on these three parameters they graded the tls from grade 0 to grade 5 coming to the treatment part now aggressive hydration is the first and foremost in the treatment either preventive as well as treatment hyperkalemia is treated with high, aggressive hydration hypertonic dextrose and insulin loop diuretics and in some extreme cases even dialysis may be required hyperphosphatemia again aggressive hydration hypertonic dextrose insulin and oral phosphate binders like aluminum hydroxide hypocalcemia if it is asymptomatic does not require any treatment because it is taken care of when we treat the hyperphosphatemia but if the hyper hypocalcemia is symptomatic then iv calcium gluconate should be given now coming to the hypouricemic agents the two drugs most commonly used hypouricemic agents are allopurinol and rasburicase and we should know a little bit more about these two this is the purine catabolism pathway a xanthine and hypoxanthine they get converted to uric acid because of the enzyme xanthine oxidase so allopurinol is a potent inhibitor of this xanthine oxidase and blocks the conversion of hypoxanthine and xanthine to uric acid so allopurinol blocks this xanthine oxidase okay although allopurinol prevents new uric, uric acid formation but it does not reduce the amount of uric acid if it is already present and moreover it takes two to three days uh, before the serum uric acid concentrations begin to fall rasburicase <clears throat> now coming to rasburicase again you can see here the uric acid which is formed normally the uric acid is converted to allantoin because of the enzyme urate oxidase which is present in most of the mammals but the human beings they lack this enzyme urate oxidase that is why there is a high accumulation of uric acid in human beings so rasburicase is a recombinant form of urate oxidase and this rasburicase acts immediately within four hours and converts the uric acid into allantoin which is five to ten times more soluble and gets excreted in urine so these are the point of actions of allopurinol and rasburicase you can see here allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor so it prevents the new uric acid being uh, formed but it has no effect on the already formed uric acid while rasburicase it converts the uric acid into allantoin which has got a high, high urinary excretion this is the comparison of allopurinol and rasburicase now allopurinol is oral easy to use and inexpensive but it's slow onset of it has got a slow onset of action and has no effect on the pre-existing uric acid levels rasburicase has to be used intravenously it is expensive but it's rapid onset of action and lowers even the pre-existing uric acid levels at this point i would like to give you one very important practical tip again as i told you rasburicase rapidly converts uric acid to allantoin and its action also continues in vitro which means after drawing the sample if the sample is not processed quickly and there is a delay the uric acid levels in the sample will keep on going down rapidly and will give a very low value so hence whenever a patient or patient sample who is receiving rasburicase comes to the lab it has to be processed immediately not only that from our experience we can tell you that most of the nursing staff and rmos are not aware of this and sometimes the delay is from their side so you as a pathologist have to be proactive and instruct them about it to send the samples immediately to the lab now this is the uh, these are the guidelines for TLS risk stratification, again, the lab parameters play a very important role here. I'll just give you an example of Burkitt's lymphoma. Here, there's nothing like low risk Burkitt's lymphoma. Intermediate uh, risk Burkitt's lymphoma means early stage disease with LDH less than two times upper limit of normal. And high risk means advanced or early stage uh, disease with LDH more than or equal to two times upper limit of normal. Coming to DLB cell, again, there's nothing like low risk. Intermediate risk means LDH more than equal to two times upper limit of normal and non-bulky disease. And why if the disease is bulky with LDH more than two times upper limit of normal, it is a high risk DLBCL. So this is how risk stratification is done. 
which is important from treatment point of view. So once we have stratified the patient, these are the guidelines for management of TLS. For a minimal risk patient, there is no prophylaxis is indicated. For a low risk patient, prophylaxis, a prophylactic hydration and allopurinol can be given and daily lab tests are, should be done. For an intermediate risk patient, prophylaxis with hydration plus allopurinol and raspberry gas also can be considered and lab tests every 8 to 12 hours have to be done. Now, high risk patient, hydration, raspberry gas is a must and lab, lab test should be done every 6 to 8 hours with cardiac monitoring. If the patient is in clinical TLS, hydration, raspberry gas, lab test every 4 to 6 hours, cardiac monitoring has to be done and your patient has to be in ICU. So to summarize, I have already told you, tumor lysis and phenomenon is because of massive cell lysis which releases uric acid, phosphorus and potassium which in turn leads to acute kidney injury, cardiac arrhythmias and seizures which are potentially life threatening. Most often it is seen in high grade lymphomas like Burkitt's and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Diagnosis of TLS is done by Cairo Bishop classification and further risk stratification is done. Prophylaxis with volume expansion is the mainstay of preventing TLS in any risk category and patients at high risk of TLS should receive raspberry case for initial treatment of hyperuricemia. Now, whatever I have spoken for the last 20 minutes, this is TLS in a nutshell. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Procedure, uh, you will have a various portion. Thank you, sir, for showing up the next step. Our dean, sir, Dr. Dilip Gore, has joined us. He was busy with a surgical cap. I request Dr. Mangesh, sir, to wake up with a throat part. I request our dean, sir, Dr. Vigil Kode, to please enter the chat. Very good afternoon to all of you. And I am, first of all, very sorry that I was not, uh, I could not be present at about 11.30. So we were having some surgical uh, camp there. It's really a wonderful feeling that ultimately such type of uh, collaborative efforts have brought out uh, with such fantastic uh, CME. And uh, it speaks that uh, the, uh, the MOU with NCI, National Cancer Institute, is in a good spirit in working. So many times we just do the MOUs and forget about it. So I think we need to keep on doing such activities. Not only uh, we should stop here and doing the CMEs, but also there could be some exchange program for the faculty. Also we could have, now we are also having students here. So we could send some of our students to watch uh, surgeries or even your uh, surgical protocols, oncological protocols, so that they are well versed with oncology and principles of oncological surgery. So once again, I congratulate our uh, head of the department, Professor uh, Davinda Madam, who took the initiative to have his uh, CME. Uh, an entire department uh, is to be given credit for their uh, such a wonderful, and especially the topic which they have chosen for this CME. So once again, I congratulate all of you. I thank the NCI. And as a dean of this institution, I would like the faculties of NCI to visit us uh, sometimes in this month or maybe later this month so that we could have uh, discussions on how to go further or we could, I could, uh, the entire department of pathology can come there. So let us also not uh, restrict the MOU for department of pathology. It has to extend in all the academic arenas, in all the 
uh, operative readiness and even uh, whatever uh, NCI has so many plus things uh, than any medical college. So let us all extend those and let us all explore those horizons. Once again, I congratulate Madam Navande and entire uh, her pathology team who has been leading. Otherwise, also they are very, very active team in our medical college. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, and thank you very much all the uh, delegates for inviting me. And I, I wish wish you the deliberation of this day would be helpful to you in your practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for applying also appreciation. Now, I would like to request Dr. Umok, sir, to give us a brief expose comment opinion. Thank you, madam. This was a this was a really informative webinar. Started with Dr. Patak as a clinical approach to the patient. And he explained the important thing about the histopathology, ISC, CT, and PET scan, and its importance in the staging of the tumor. Then the next lecture was by Dr. Meena Pangarkar, who has described the importance of ISC in the lymphoma. And it was really a very informative talk by Dr. Meena Pangarkar. Dr. Kishore Vishpande explained the importance of flow cytometry as far as the diagnosis in lymphoma and leukemia. And he gave a very important tips about the flow cytometry. Then uh, Dr. Page gave the importance of biopsy and the biopsy is not only important, but also that with the biopsy, you should go with the ISC and molecular typing for a diagnosis of lymphoma. And the diagnosis of lymphoma, its importance in the treatment of the lymphoreticular malignancy. She gave a very informative talk on that. And uh, Dr. Chaitanya Munshi, who talked a very important topic of tumor lysis syndrome, which is really a clinical topic, the very Least number of pathologists must be knowing about this tumor lysis syndrome because this tumor lysis syndrome doesn't appear in the books of pathology. But this seems a very important topic as far as the pathologist as well as the clinician and the patient is concerned. And uh, this becomes a medical emergency. And he gave a very nice talk about this. So I congratulate all the speakers as far as the topic is concerned. And I also congratulate Dr. Pratibha Davande for keeping this topic and it was really informative for the pathologist as well as for the clinician. Thank you very much. On this very winter afternoon, after this heavy informative session, let's have a much needed tea break. We will resume the session after 15 minutes at 2 18.
things.
Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing team for giving me this opportunity. Today's topic of presentation is role of bone marrow examination and molecular studies in staging landscape of lymphomas. These are my disclaimers. So why there is a need of bone marrow examination in lymphoma? First of all, it can be used as a diagnostic tool wherever excisional or uh, excisional node biopsy is not available or histopathological diagnosis because of uh, uh, deep seated lesion where biopsy cannot be possible. In those circumstances, bone marrow can serve as a diagnostic tool. Bone marrow aspiration can be subjected to flow cytometry and uh, bone marrow biopsy can be used uh, for IHC for a specific diagnosis. Another, the most important part of uh, bone marrow is in the staging of lymphomas. It has been included in all the uh, uh, staging of Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And marrow involvement upstage 
the stage to stage 4 that is the last stage it can be also used to assess tumor load and its pattern to assess marrow reserves to rule out any other pathology like marrow hypoplasia because of uh, chemotherapy and even in post chemotherapy uh, chemotherapy setting for uh, monitoring the effects of chemotherapy uh, so what are the prerequisites uh, for the bone marrow procedure? Uh, you will need an appropriate indication and uh, informed consent, detailed clinical and investigation history. Here in MCI, we use sala needle for bone marrow aspiration and junction for bone marrow wax. Both these needles are available in all steel variant and are disposable ones, which are uh, used one series, uh, used once uh, needles. Uh, and apart from it, you will need consumables. So, while doing this procedure, uh, you will have uh, various questions in mind. What site is uh, adequate from where you should take the biopsy, whether to take unilateral or bilateral bone marrow examination, what length of biopsy is appropriate, whether your aspiration is adequate, uh, and how to process the sample. Uh, so, we will be dealing them one by one. Sternum and uh, posterior superior like spine are the most common sites for bone marrow aspiration. Uh, but bone marrow biopsy cannot be done from sternum because of the thickness of bone and um, presence of uh, vital structure uh, below the sternum. Uh, so the best uh, site uh, for doing bone marrow aspiration biopsy is um, uh, right or left posterior superior like spine. Uh, there are only few contraindications for this procedure. Uh, first is skeletal abnormalities, coagulopathies, or local sighting. So after uh, doing the procedure, uh, you have to collect the uh, collect the samples for bone marrow aspiration biopsy. So for bone marrow aspiration, you have to collect samples in EDTA and heparin ricutaneous. EDTA will serve uh, for flow cytometry, fluorescent in situ hybridization, and molecular studies here. And a pattern sample um, for conventional cytosine. For bone marrow biopsy, uh, you must take imprint as uh, it is a very important diagnostic tool in cases of uh, dry taps or difficult marrow. Um, you can fix your uh, bone marrow biopsy in neutral buffer formally and uh, decalcify it using uh, various uh, decalcifying agents. Uh, so the most commonly used for bone marrow biopsy are PDTA or formic acid based uh, decalcifying agent. We are using AZF in our institute for decalcification. Uh, EDTA will require a little more time for decalcification and so it will in turn increase your uh, turnaround. So what are the adequacy criteria for bone marrow aspiration and the biopsy? So for the bone marrow aspiration, uh, you have to um, see the bone marrow species or on morphology or microscopy, you have to see the metacaricides. That means you are in the marrow space. And uh, as for example, for iron stain, you have to see at least seven bone marrow species or bone marrow particles uh, to say that bone marrow is, uh, iron is absent uh, from your uh, bone marrow. Biopsy, uh, unilateral or bilateral, uh, in 2014, uh, in one of the papers, uh, that's of Lugano classification, they mentioned that unilateral 2.5 centimeter biopsy is adequate for staging of all lipids. Involvement on uh, biopsy is very specific, and on aspiration, at first, you will see abnormal large sized lymphocyte cells. Or, uh, there can be a lymphocytosis of uh, more than 30%, which is uh, suggestive of involvement of uh, bone marrow uh, with lipo. Uh, on bone marrow biopsy, uh, the patterns of involvement uh, can be seen, which can range from diffuse, nodular, paratrabecular, intracinusoidal, or it can be a mixed part. Differentiating between benign lymphoid aggregates in a nodular involvement of bone marrow and lipomatous involvement is very essential. And each bone marrow biopsy should be uh, accompanied with uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, these are the various patterns of bone marrow involvement. I would like to say paratrabecular bone marrow involvement of biopsy is highly suggestive of uh, lymphomatous involvement of uh, bone marrow. Uh, 
whereas nodular uh, has to be differentiated from benign lymphoid aggregates and lymphomas. Uh, among B lineage lymphomas, bone marrow infiltration is more common in low grade tumors than in high grade. Overall infiltration is probably more common in B cell lymphomas than T cell. And increased reticulin deposition, restricted to the area of marrow infiltration, is common in lymphomas. So how to differentiate between these reactive lymphoid nodules versus lymphoid? So morphologically, reactive lymphoid nodules are small with well-defined margins. It has polymorphous cell population made up of predominantly of small lymphocyte, immunoblast, macrophages, and plasma cells. A small feeder capillary leading towards the center and a reactive corona of eosinophils in adjacent nerve. Whereas lymphoma infiltrates are usually large with less well-defined margins and often extending outwards around the axis and have a relatively homogeneous cellular composition. But these are the morphological differences, but it can be further confirmed by immunostic chemistry using CDP and CDP. Uh, in a benign uh, aggregates, uh, there is a preponderance of uh, T lymphocytes and uh, there will be a scarcity of uh, uh, or in some cases, uh, they, are, they can be seen up to 20%. Uh, but in cases of lymphoma infiltrate, uh, in cases of uh, B cell uh, non functional lymphoma, you will see preponderance of uh, B lymphocytes uh, in the bone marrow. Right? So that's how you can differentiate between this. Discordance lymphoma needs a special mention. Uh, discordance between the type of lymphoma seen in the marrow and appear present in the lymph node or other tissue seen in almost 16 to 40% of cases. Discordance in grade of lymphoma 6% to 21%. Uh, it is most uh, often seen in B cell lymphomas, although uh, some papers have uh, reported and, and observed the discordance up to 25% in T cell lymphomas. Uh, the uh, there is a very interesting phenomenon where there is a presence of follicular lymphoma in the lymph node. And the lymphoplasmacytic uh, infiltration in the bone marrow. Uh, so, why it is happening? So, it is because of the differentiation of tumor in the marrow, because of uh, the difference in the microenvironment. Bone marrow uh, can also be used, a very useful uh, tool in post chemotherapy bone marrow examination. Uh, if uh, there is a baseline involvement of bone marrow with lymphoma, uh, it can be uh, used to, to assess the residual lymphoma, uh, unexplained um, causes of anemia and cytopenia, uh, to detect uh, fever red cell aplasia or uh, aplasia of marrow related to the chemotherapy or for the investigation of pyrexia of unknown origin and suspected. Uh, what is the clinical significance of bone marrow involvement? First of all, it will up the stage to stage 4, uh, particularly uh, where there is a stage 1 or 2 lymphoma and on bone marrow is involved, uh, then certainly there will be difference uh, in the approach and uh, in cases uh, in the number of uh, cycles. In low-grade lymphomas, the presence of marrow involvement does not adversely affect the lymphoma. Whereas the patient where high-grade lymphoma at an extramedullary site and presence of high-grade it is a poor prognosis. And presence of low grade lymphoma in the marrow of patients with high grade lymphoma, uh, it has no adverse effect on prognosis. But such patients are at a continuing risk of relapse uh, of uh, low grade lymphoma relapse when, uh, from the marrow. So, this is uh, the paper published in uh, LERD uh, in 2019. Uh, so it has a uh, most included more than 3,000 cases. Uh, and it has explained the utility and patterns of use of PET CT and bone marrow biopsy for staging in non functional lymphoma. Uh, PET CT uh, in the recent year has emerged as a uh, screening and the most important uh, uh, staging tool in uh, some types of FDG avid lymphomas, which are functions and DLT. Usually, in these FDG avid lymphomas, uh, if uh, bone marrow is positive uh, by PET CT, and uh, the aggregates are nodular, we are not uh, uh, confirming them by bone marrow bias. Uh, but in cases uh, where there is a pet city is negative for involvement and patient is having cytopenias, uh, we are 
doing a good maro bhakti in in the both these techniques are complementary to each other so it's better is to recommend the use of pet uh, uh, city and bone marrow biopsy both in conjunction to improve the sensitivity for detection of uh, bone marrow involvement uh, in uh, so these are the reporting formats uh, for aspiration we have to mention the site uh, as well as aspiration which is difficult easily or to track up Uh, followed by cellularity and all the cell lineage, differentiation pattern, and last percentage, uh, lymphoid series percentage in normal cells. Uh, in biopsy, it is very important to uh, note adequacy uh, as well as uh, cellularity is uh, better assessed on bone marrow biopsy than on cellularity. The architecture of the tissue is used if it is best or if it is preserved. Uh, lineage differentiation. Uh, you have to mention the uh, whether the infiltration by any lymphoma cells or any other problems like granuloma can be seen. And if uh, there are uh, infiltration are there, uh, what pattern of involvement uh, is there? Uh, pattern of involvement uh, certainly has uh, no uh, uh, particular uh, effects on the uh, like the treatment decisions or anything. But uh, we have to mention. Pattern uh, because some patterns are uh, more relevant uh, and in favor of uh, lymphoma involvement in bone marrow biopsy. So uh, we will be starting with the, the introduction to molecular techniques in lymphoma. Uh, cytogenetics and molecular techniques uh, plays an important role for uh, diagnostic and prognostic assessment uh, in lymphoma. WHO 2017 classification has stated that the genetic markers are as important as clinical, morphological, immunophenotypic uh, features in lymphoma. And in many cases where the same case is uh, treated with the same regimen, but uh, they have a variable outcome, uh, so it is stated because of molecular heterogeneity in uh, cases of lymphoma. So where do these uh, molecular studies fit in the evaluation of lymphoma? So after the initial uh, diagnosis uh, with the help of uh, histopathology and which is uh, in the uh, almost uh, maximum number of cases, uh, very few uh, require uh, B or T cell clinical testing in a particular scenario uh, to assess uh, uh, or diagnose this particular case. Uh, but uh, molecular uh, plays a very important role uh, in prognostication and uh, predictive as well as theranostics that is uh, uh, therapy according to uh, your molecular profile or personalized medicine. Uh, these are the various uh, molecular techniques uh, which can be used uh, in uh, lymphoma that are conventional karyotype, fluorescent and cytokine hybridization, PCR, NGS, gene expression profiling. Circulating tumor DNA analysis, which is done by NGS, and B and T cell clone testing, which is essentially a PCR. Uh, so in lymphoma, uh, the uh, main uh, clinically uh, used techniques are cytogenetics and uh, so how to collect samples uh, for molecular studies. Uh, In most of the cases, uh, or, or in routine practice, uh, in, our, uh, in India, I would say, uh, is uh, after the initial diagnosis on histomorphology along with IFC, uh, the blocks are subjected for fish and molecular study, that is paraffin, uh, paraffin blocks. Uh, but you can always, if the fresh lymph node sample uh, is available, and, uh, we are crossing it. So, We can always keep a file imprint and preserve them for fish analysis. So this imprint has to be air dried, then fixed in a chilled methanol acidic acid in case to one ratio for 15 to 30 minutes and stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius so that we can use them for uh, fish analysis uh, after the initial histomorphological and accident. Uh, for cytogenetics, the uh, tissue of the small piece or one of the slices has to be stored in RTM. For uh, molecular studies, you have to snap these uh, one fourth of the node half if it is less than one and if it is more than one, 
you can take one of the strikes and you can prepare them for the purpose of molecular strikes. Which method uh, to be used in clinical practice? All mentioned methodologies are complementary. And as far as lymphomas are uh, concerned, fish and uh, we see uh, fish, cytogenetics and uh, PCR in two cases uh, are most routinely used uh, molecular uh, techniques. Mm. So, uh, the upper photograph is showing the lymphoma genesis, and depending on uh, which type of cell and uh, uh, from different types of cells like germinal cells or post germinal center cells. Uh, different kind of lymphomas are involved, and each of these has a unique molecular signature. And uh, different types of mutations are uh, causing this particular type of lymphoma. So they can be assessed, uh, uh, like in the form of IHC, in the form of protein expression, or the individual mutations like MYD88, or uh, they can be seen at the structural abnormalities, uh, like that can be assessed by conventional cytokines or fish. Uh, these are the various molecular pathways uh, which are uh, involved in lymphoma genesis. Uh, now, all these upstream and downstream uh, regulatory pathways are potential uh, targets uh, for targeted therapy. Uh, I will give you an example uh, like a BTK inhibitors. It's a ibrutinib, uh, it's a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and uh, it has uh, revolutionized the treatment of uh, CLL, SLL, particularly in labs and practice cases. Uh, this is a table taken from uh, British uh, Journal of Hematology, whether they have uh, segregated these uh, molecular uh, uh, anomalies into three different uh, categories. One is mandatory, which has to be done uh, for particular lymphomas, optional or recommended, or certain are under development, which are essentially angiosperms based panels uh, for lymphomas. So, uh, like MID88 mutation has to be done for diagnosis of lymphoplasmosis uh, lymphoma. In CLL, deletion 17P, IgVH mutation status, and uh, 53 mutation uh, has to be done for prognosti uh, prognostication and uh, predictive uh, therapy in CLL. So we come to individual techniques. Karyotyping is an old-fashioned technology. It still remains a very powerful tool and offers a broad view of the tumoral genomic landscape. You can classify the cases as a simple or complex karyotype depending on the number of chromosomal abnormalities. But it has certain limitations. At first, it is a time-consuming process. You need actively dividing cells for doing the karyotyping. It has limited resolution and uh, many cryptic uh, uh, Abnormal uh, can be uh, cannot detect cryptic abnormalities. Fluorescent in situ hybridization. It bridges the area between conventional cytogenetic analysis and molecular diagnostic. Interface fish, particularly, doesn't require the dividing cells. So it obviates the needs of cell culture, which is very difficult in certain uh, mature uh, terminally differentiated B cell nucleus. Uh, but still, karyotype and fish remains uh, the basic complementary technology to identify lymphoma associated chromosomal abrasions. Uh, you can use, uh, depending on the type of mutation, you can use uh, different types of probes, whether it's a break apart probe or a dual cell or dual kitchen uh, probe. Uh, polymerase chain reaction is the method of choice to detect single specific gene mutation. Uh, the example is MID88, which is used in uh, PCR should not be the upfront method for identification of specific chromosomal translocation because of the significant incidence of false negative uh, It is most commonly used in B and T cell clonality testing. <coughs> uh, B and T cell clonality testing, uh, it is done uh, for immunoglobulin receptor and uh, uh, T cell receptor gene regulation. Uh, it is not required for routine diagnostic purpose, uh, but the use of clonality testing is uh, uh, limited to suspicion of lymphoma clinically despite reactive morphological features. Or whether B or T cell lineage orientation uh, cannot be confirmed by immunology. Uh, or there is a doubt on clonal origin of lymphoid disorder during follow up or uh, RT relapse or treatment refractory. 
there are uh, immunoglobulin and PCR rearrangement occurs earliest in the stages of maturation in the uh, like at first in uh, B cell receptor like IgH uh, rearrangement occurs first followed by Kappa and Lambda. So we taste this rearrangement in the same fashion. Uh, also in cases of uh, T cell receptor, although the TCR uh, gamma happens uh, before uh, TCR delta, but we are uh, doing TCR delta before because of if the TCR alpha is rearranged, it will change the um, rearrangement of gamma. So uh, it will be better to do TCR delta first followed by gamma, then TCR beta and then alpha. Uh, so what are the pitfalls of clonality testing? Uh, it can be false negative if the primers using PCR based clonality test do not cover all IPS and PCR. So many labs doesn't uh, do this uh, clonality testing on all the IGH and PCR. Uh, so they are only using IGH or IGH kappa, they are not using IPS kappa. So that's why it can give a false negative. Uh, some physiological phenomenon uh, will uh, interfere with this test. There is a somatic hypermutation and acetyl class uh, It can be false positive in cases of infections or uh, it can show pseudo monoclonal -mono patterns. Uh, the use of NGS in uh, lymphomas has been increasing consistently. Uh, so there is a new score like the uh, Molecular Lymphoma International Prognostic Index is a well-established uh, prognostic index for molecular lymphoma. Uh, now, recently, they have included a uh, mutation status of seven genes that are EZH2, ARIT1A, MEF2B, EP300, FOXO1, and CRBBP, and CARD11. Uh, so, depending on uh, the by including this mutation status along with uh, the prognostic index, which has already been established and got performance score, uh, you will get a more thorough uh, uh, prognostic and uh, predictive uh, value uh, after including these mutations. And it is most commonly done by And uh, in upcoming years, we will be seeing more and more involvement of this mutational landscape of lymphomas in um, our uh, diagnostic as well as prognostic and predictive setting. Uh, NCCM has also uh, included this uh, molecular studies in essential category, like in lymphoblastic lymphoma, cardiotype, and fish for specific translocations are used. Uh, and Burkitt lymphoma, again, the cardiotype and fish are for particular variants and translocations must for the diagnosis and initial uh, assessment of uh, so this I will uh, in my uh, talk and thank you very much again for providing me the opportunity uh, for on this prestigious platform. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for imparting your precious knowledge. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's call Dr. Shweta Devukar, ma'am, Consultant Department of Pathology at National Cancer Institute, Nagpur. She will enlighten us on an overview of T-cell lymphoma classification, diagnostic anaplasty, class, the large cell lymphoma, and peripheral T-cell lymphoma, not otherwise classified. The session will be chaired by Dr. Prachi Sanjati, ma'am. Dr. Shweta, ma'am, please. A very good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the entire pathology team of the Tamagi Institute of Medical Sciences for inviting me as a speaker. Today, I will be talking about T-cell lymphomas, particularly the major T-cell lymphomas and two specific entities, anaplastic large cell lymphomas and peripheral T-cell lymphomas, not otherwise specific. So here is the roadmap of today's discussion. I'll start with what is new in recent T-cell lymphoma classification, a special characteristic of these lymphomas 
I'll discuss a few cases we reported at NCI related to two distinct subtypes of peripheral T cell lymphomas. Why is it relevant and important to identify each subtype correctly? And lastly, we'll end with the conclusions. So a few important facts about T cell lymphomas. This T cell lymphoma are pathologically and clinically complex and heterogeneous group of rare neoplasms. Hence, a biologically relevant and clinically useful classification for mature T cell lymphoma is difficult to establish. And also they come with a poorer prognosis as um, compared to the B cell lymphomas. When talking about the cell of origin, just like B cells, T cell lymphomas correspond to various stages of T cell maturation. These cells born in the bone marrow undergo T cell receptor gene rearrangement in the thymus and eventually emerge as maturity lymphocytes. They are divided into many subtypes like helper, natural killer, suppressor, or regulatory T cells. So T cell lymphoblastic lymphoma arise from the immature thymic T cells, whereas peripheral T cell lymphoma has origin in mature terminally differentiated T cells. This picture further clarifies different cells of origins for different T cell lymphomas. So what is new in 2016 edition of lymphoma WHO classification? It has added a new framework which provided valuable insights regarding management. For example, a newer entity, breast implant associated AL cell has been added, which has a favorable prognosis. Another entity, primary cutaneous CD4 positive small medium T cell lymphoma, was modified to primary cutaneous CD4 positive small medium T cell lymphoproliferative disorder because of its indolent clinical behavior and a certain malignant potential. They have separately identified indolent T cell lymphoproliferative disorder of gastrointestinal tract and primary cutaneous acrylic CD8 positive T cell lymphoma as provisional entities presenting within the gastrointestinal tract and outer ear respectively. These disorders can be mistaken for aggressive T cell lymphomas and can be given unnecessary treatment. So, as such, identification is important to avoid overtreatment in T cell lymphomas. Mature T cell lymphoma can broadly be categorized for easier understanding as cutaneous, extranodal, nodal, and leukemias arising from mature T cells. This pie chart gives relative percentage of individual T cell lymphoma. The three most common T cell lymphomas are angioendoplastic T cell lymphoma, anaplastic last cell lymphomas, and peripheral T cell lymphoma. They probably make up to 10 to 15 percent of all lymphomas. So we will talk about ALCL and PTCL NOS as we frequently encounter them in day to day practice more than other types of T cell lymphomas. So, what has changed in recent classification? There is an addition of ALK negative ALCL as a distinct entity, which was considered provisional before. Also, a newer entity of breast implant associated ALCL has been added, which has a better prognosis. Then there are newer genetic alteration in PTCL NOS like GATA3, TBX21 overexpression, or identification of constitutive activation of JAKSTAT pathway in ALCLs. What makes these changes interesting is the distinct prognosis of each category. On the other hand, there are some molecular alterations overlapping between the different PTCL subtypes. This Venn diagram shows some unique and shared mutations in three major subtypes of peripheral T cell lymphomas, and each mutation is associated with different behavior. For example, TP63 rearrangement in ALCL are rare and associated with chemotherapy refractoriness and a poor outcome. There are certain mutations like TT2 and DNMT3A shared by all of these subtypes. So studying molecular alteration has become an integral part of lymphoma management. Now, how can we get closer to diagnosis of any T cell lymphoma correctly? The answer is there is no algorithmic approach for pathological analysis. A large part of arriving at a diagnosis involves a pathologist correlating the histology features with immunophenotyping molecular features and often necessary clinical information. In the T-cell lymphomas in particular, it is very complicated to clearly and precisely define each subtype as features commonly overlap between different subtypes. Here we see distinct clinical and IC features of different PTCs. Uh, like B-cell lymphomas, these patients present with generalized lymphadenopathy, B symptoms of unexplained a recurring and persistent fever, drenching night sweats, or unexplained weight loss. Uh, there may be splenomegaly, skin rash, etc. And there is variable combination of T cell markers like CD4 uh, 
positivity in peripheral T cell lymphoma or T follicular hepal phenotype markers like CD10, BCL6, or PD1, along with hyperplasia of follicular dendritic cells seen by CD21 ISC in angioinoblastic T cell lymphoma, and also predictive markers like ALK or CD30. So now let us discuss a few cases. This was a 22-year-old male patient, complaint of generalized lymphadenopathy, back pain. However, no significant weight loss or fever history. CT scan showed generalized lymphadenopathy with extensive retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Also, there were lytic lesions in vertebrae with surrounding soft tissue component. Biopsy done from the axillary node showed atypical lymph node proliferation, favoring anaplastic large cell lymphomas. HG section showed effaced architecture with atypical lymphoid cells. There are many large mononuclear cells with a few horseshoe shaped nuclei and prominent nuclei, nucleoli can also be seen. Also, with, uh, there is perineal extension and bricks my mitosis. IC panel was run. The largest cell shows dense CD30 positivity. Also, showed diffuse immunoreactivity of CD2, CD4, CD5. This large atypical set showed nuclear and uh, cytoplasmic expression of L1. While negative for CD20, CD15, PAX5, so the diagnosis of anaplastic last cell lymphoma, L positive, was given. This was another case of 35-year-old male, complained of pain and swelling or posterior aspect of tibia, with weight loss, fever, and generalized weakness. CT scan showed generalized lymphadenopathy with lytic lesions at upper end of tibia. Biopsy from tibia lesion revealed only necrotic material, while inguinal node biopsy showed a high grade malignancy. Based on histomorphology, we had to rule out lymphoma, including DL, BCL, and also Hodgkin lymphoma, carcinoma, and sarcoma, considering the TBL mass with large nodes. So, lymph nodes showed a diffusely effaced architecture with many small lymphocytes in background. There were many bi and multinucleated giant cells seen interspersed. There are few of these are donor shepherd. On ISC, these cells were positive for CD45, CD30, EMA, CD43, and negative for ALK, CD5, CD8, CD20, BCL2, BCL6, and pan -CK. So the diagnosis here given was anaplastic last cell lymphoma, ALK negative. So let's take an overview of anaplastic last cell lymphoma. They make 3% of all lymphomas and 10 to 20% of all childhood lymphomas, majority present in late stages. Histomorphology shows small to uh, large lymphoma cells with a variable proportion of hallmark cells, which are horseshoe or kidney shaped. There are different patterns like small cell lymphoestrocytic pattern, Hodgkin like pattern, or a composite pattern. The atypical cells growth can be seen only in sinuses, which mimics carcinoma. IC shows strong positivity for CD30, variable pattern of ALK expression in ALK positive cases, and variable T cell marker, or there may be completely negative for T cell markers. One thing I would like to mention here is that only ALK1 clone of ALK antibody should be used in ALCL, as it is less sensitive to other malignancies, and so should not be used for other solid malignancies. ALCL also has different types like ALK positive, ALK negative, breast implant associated or primary cutaneous ALCL. Because of their variable morphology, they can mimic Hodgkin lymphoma, sarcomatoid carcinoma, melanomas, and pleomorphic sarcomas. So combination of CD30 and ALK should help us reach to a correct diagnosis. Pattern of CD30 positivity is very important in separating ALK negative ALCL from other lymphomas along with related ISC panels. Just in brief about ALK positive and ALK negative lymphoma uh, ALCS. They are similar on morphology but differ in certain aspects, particularly molecular levels. Unlike ALK positive ALCL, which is most commonly seen in children and young adults, ALK negative ALCL occurs mostly in adults. Both are male predominance. ALK positive ALCL has translocation 2 to 5. Uh, which gives ALK IC positivity, while ALK negative ALCL uh, has DUSP 22 year arrangement and TP63 translocation and has a poorer, poorer survival compared to ALK positive ALCL. Now, coming to the case of a 17 year old male with bilateral neck swellings, moderate fever, chest pain, mild cough since one month, exertional breathlessness, loss of appetite. CT scan showed multiple enlarged, discrete, non necrotic, supra infradiagnostic lymph nodes. 
my splenomegaly and bilateral pleural diffusion. No definite mass lesion was seen anywhere on CT scan. Considering his age, tumor markers were uh, also done, like beta SCG and AFP, which were normal. Biopsy from supraclavicular nose showed a high grade malignancy. So, diagnosis were fresh, very uh, anaplastic glassy lymphoma, DLBCL versus poorly differentiated carcinoma. HG section showed effacement of normal architecture, multiple nodules of large round cells with scanty cytoplasm, high NC ratio, and atypical media. Also, focal areas of necrosis seen. IC panel showed these cells to be positive strongly for CD3, CD4, and CD5. CD8 expression is, however, reduced. They were negative for CD10, CD20, BCL6, CD30, CD56. Pan CK, EMA, and ALK. Uh, also, with uh, uh, high proliferation index around 80%. Considering T cell marker positivity, CD21 was added, which turned out to be negative. And uh, considering ISC profile clinical presentation, diagnosis of PTCL NOS was given. So this was a 44 year old woman who was already on treatment for TB for generalized lymphadenopathy. She still had persist persistent weakness, fever, and cough. CT scan showed multiple enlarged conglomerating lymph nodes. Axillary lymph node biopsy was suspicious of lymphoma. SC section showed diffuse leafless nodal architecture with paracortical expansion, infiltration by medium sized lymphoid cells mixed with many small lymphocytes. The lesionous cells had over-indented nuclei, dispersed chromatin, and inconspicuous nuclei. Lesionous cells are positive for CD3, CD4, CD2, CD5. CD21 was seen in the reduced dendritic cell measure. And these cells, uh, CD20 positivity is seen in the few remaining germano centers, whereas uh, cells are negative for CD8, CD10, CD30, and CD. Uh, and also with a high proliferation index of almost 70%. So, final diagnosis of peripheral T cell lymphoma NOS was given. So, we saw two cases of PTCL NOS in two patients with different age and clinical presentation. Peripheral T cell lymphoma's NOS is a heterogeneous category. It's a heterogeneous category of nodal and extranodal mature T cell lymphomas that do not correspond to any of the specifically defined entities of mature T cell lymphoma in the current classification. It is mostly seen in adults, rare in children with a male preponderance, occurs at a nodal as well as extranodal site. Histologically, may show diffuse paracortical effacement with medium to large cell cells and an inflammatory background, including small lymphocytes, eosinophil plasma cells, and epithelial histiocytes. IC shows variable expression of pan T cell markers like CD2, CD3, CD5, CD7. CD4 and CD8 may present in different combinations like dual positivity or dual negativity, or expression of either CD4 or CD8 at a time. And so uh, they show CD, may show CD56 positivity. Occasionally, CD30, CD15 positivity can be seen. There are different molecular subtypes as well associated with different behavior and response to therapy, like TBS21, which is associated with a more favorable clinical course and with longer overall survival compared to the GATA3 sub. In general, PTCL are aggressive lymphomas with poor response to therapy and low overall survival. Also, there are many lymphomas which form a close differential to PTCL NOS. ALK negative ALCL being the closest one. CD30 is also expressed by a subset of PTCL NOS. However, ALK negative ALCL differs in respect of the hallmark cells, the kidney shepherd or horseshoe shepherd cells, strong and uniform CD30 positivity, hemopositivity, and cytotoxic marker expression. Also, they carry different genetic aberrations. ALK negative ALCL carries genomic uh, aberration like the USP22 and the TP63D arrangement, which has not been reported in PTCL NOS till date. Likewise, for other differentials that are ALK positive ALCL, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphomas, adult T cell leukemia lymphoma, an extended IC panel can be run separately for each entity. So why should we stress over correctly subtyping PTCL? The data here shows overall survival of PTCL subtypes is generally poor. 
uh, there is an exception being elk positive ASL, which has a five year old five year survival of 80 percent for elk negative ASL, the five year survival is 44 percent and even lesser for angioblastic and peripheral t cell lymphomas annoys basically each difference of types of pt cell comes with a varied prognosis to, uh, progression free survival and overall survival making categorization among pt cells extremely crucial Coming to therapy part, along with conventional chemotherapy of CHOP uh, that like uh, used in B-cell lymphomas, etoposide can also be added to CHOP therapy in T-cell lymphomas. Also targeted therapy like CD30 antibody, brentuximab, vendotin, or ALK inhibitor are being used. At this stage, it is extremely important to categorize each subtype of T-cell lymphoma as each one is subjected to different treatment modalities. The progress made in identifying genetic drivers of peripheral T cell lymphoma has provided valuable insights into disease biology and new targets for study. However, most of this knowledge has yet to be translated into the clinical practice. So, in conclusion, it can be stated that T cell lymphomas are unpredictable in their behavior. More emphasis should be given on pathologists' interpretation of constellation of features. We should consider a detailed history and make diligent use of immunohistochemistry before giving auto diagnosis of T cell lymphomas. Also, more clinical trials are needed to focus on the biology of T cell lymphoma subtypes to move uh, toward a more personalized therapy. So, I'll say fighting cancer is a teamwork. A harmony is necessary in interdisciplinary team for diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation of lymphoma patients. This concludes my talk. Thank you again. Thank you, ma'am, for an entirely talk. Now, may I request Dr. Ankita Tamani? First of all, I would like to thank the organizing team for giving me this opportunity. Today's topic of presentation is role of bone marrow examination and molecular studies in staging landscape of lymphomas. These are my disclaimers. So why there is a need of bone marrow examination in lymphoma? First of all, it can be used as a diagnostic tool wherever excisional or uh, excisional node biopsy is not available or histopathological diagnosis because of uh, uh, deep seated lesion where biopsy cannot be possible in those circumstances bone marrow can serve as sorry for inconvenience may i request dr ankita ramani junior consultant department of pathology national cancer institute to illuminate us on topic approach to diagnosis of hodgkin's lymphoma embracing the basics a very dynamic personality and a gold medal holder at her PG degree. She is honorary secretary of EATM for the year 2021. The session will be chaired by Dr. Prachi Sanjeevi Ma'am. I request Dr. Ankita. Dr. Ankita, please. Very good afternoon to all. Today we will be discussing about an approach to diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, right from starting from the basics, like how to approach uh, a lymph node of a Hodgkin lymphoma in its uh, clinical suspicion. I am Dr. Ankita Tamhane, Junior Consultant from Department of Pathology, National Cancer Institute, Nagpur. This is the disclaimer. So the roadmap for today's diagnosis is uh, first, when a lymph node comes on your reporting tray, how to go about it, how to approach a lymph node in a clinical suspicion of Hodgkin lymphoma. Then what is the histopathogenesis? I'll be ju just discussing a brief overview. Then what are the various subtypes of Hodgkin lymphoma? Then certain uh, words of caution. Then what are the differentials to be kept in mind? And ultimately, the final take-home message. So, uh, when a lymph node comes on your reporting tray, first and foremost thing is, it is the size which you, can, uh, which you should see. So, uh, when a lymph node of a very small size, like less than 0.5 centimeter or 1 centimeter, uh, when it comes on, a, on your reporting tray, one should always be very cautious about it. Because, uh, as you can see in this left image, 
this is a, a group of two to three lymph nodes with a very small size uh, size these are very small size lymph nodes right so also on microscopy here you can see is uh, there are reactive uh, lymphoid follicles at the periphery so basically this is a reactive lymph node so when one person such such kind of lymph nodes on their report in on the reporting tray and uh, the clinical suspicion is of Hodgkin, of any lymphoma per se one should always be very cautious while reporting it whereas uh, in the right image you can see a large lymph node uh, and also the com there is complete effacement of the entire lymph node architecture by neoplastic cells so this is not not a normal uh, lymphoid architecture my seniors have already discussed about the normal lymph node architecture and uh, various types of lymphoma so basically this is not a normal lymph node per se this is for my uh, junior uh, residents of pathology so while grossing when you receive a lymph node and uh, on the requisition form you you see that uh, there's a suspicion of any kind of a lymphoma so on cut section one should always be very careful because cut section can actually guide you towards the diagnosis so this less left image shows a normal lymph node cut section here you can see at the periphery this is a normal lymph node uh, lymphoid architecture whereas the center that is the hilum is completely replaced by uh, the the fat whereas on the right this is a lymph node of a lymphoma typically the entire lymph node is replaced by very fleshy nodular tan white neoplastic uh, neoplastic cells neoplastic mass rather right so this is a very typical cut, cut section of any lymphoma now coming to a brief overview of hodgkin lymphoma so it accounts for 0.7 percent of all new cancers in the united states uh, average age of diagnosis is 32 years but it is most common in uh, young adults also even in pediatric age group hodgkin lymphoma is very common but what is the very uh, uh, highlighting point about this cancer is this was the first human cancer to be successfully treated with radiation therapy and chemotherapy and is curable in most cases here i would like to uh, highlight that curable uh, mean i mean that at a early stage if it is diagnosed and treated it is indeed very curable and at our center we have seen uh, plenty of cases who are diagnosed with early stage of Hodgkin lymphoma and they have uh, got ex great uh, disease outcome. So what are the clinical hallmarks of Hodgkin lymphoma? First and foremost, um, uh, most common hallmark is localized uh, lymphadenopathy, which is restricted to a single group of lymph nodes. Most commonly patient presents with cervical lymphadenopathy. Very rarely, uh, like mesenteric lymph nodes wildering or extra nodal presentation uh, might be there. When this kind of presentation is there, one should always think of NHL first rather than thinking of Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, so now how does the Hodgkin lymphoma spread? So the, the route of spread is from the lymph node to the spleen, to the liver and ultimately to the bone marrow. Most commonly, Hodgkin lymphoma is staged according to the Ann Arbor staging. So what is this Ann Arbor staging? Stage 1 comprises of localized disease with single lymph node or a single organ involvement above the diaphragm. Then uh, stage 2 is two or more group of lymph nodes on the same side of the diaphragm. Stage 3 is two or more group of lymph nodes above and below the diaphragm. And stage four is extensive disease with extensive lymphadenopathy, uh, solid organ in involvement, as well as the marrow involvement. So how does the pathogenesis of Hodgkin lymphoma occur? Like how this Hodgkin lymph lymphoma develops? So the culprit cells are the RS cells. How are these RS cells formed? RS cells basically are uh, germinal center or post-germinal center B cells. And because of clonal IGH rearrangement, epigenetic changes, inuploidy, 
clonal uh, chromosomal aberrations, copy number gains, etc., they become neoplastic. And uh, I will also tell you that how do they uh, like become RS cells? So the main role is played by the transcription factor NFK beta. So what does this NFK beta transcription factor do? It first and foremost thing, it saves these crippled germinal or post germinal B cells from apoptosis. So those cells which are not functioning or what, which, uh, whichever are damaged, uh, this NFK beta saves these B cells from apoptosis and it transforms them into RS cells. Then also it helps in RS cell survival. And if uh, in addition to that, if uh, Epstein-Barr virus infection has, uh, the patient is positive for uh, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, Epstein virus infection, it causes upregulation of this NFK beta adding to the uh, to the pathogenesis of this entity. Also on uh, histomorphology, we see a very uh, varied histomorphological picture in Hodgkin lymphoma, right from various uh, like a different uh, architectural pattern to extensive plethora of uh, uh, cells in the background. So why does this happen? So these RS cells, they secrete extensive number of cytokines, chemokines, and other factors like um, interleukin-5, interleukin-10, eotaxin. Uh, RS cells secrete these and therefore they attract various kind of cells uh, in the background. So that is the reason why we see different architectural patterns and uh, different uh, types of cells in the background. Typically, Hodgkin lymphoma is classified into two subtypes, classical Hodgkin lymphoma and nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So what is the clinical implication of classifying Hodgkin lymphoma? Uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma is uh, treated by ABVD and nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin lymphoma is treated by RCHOP or ABVD or even in some cases, if there is single uh, lymph, group of uh, lymph nodes involved, only excision is done and the patient is kept on follow-up or local RT is given. So NLPHL at a very early stage carries an excellent prognosis. Now, first we'll be discussing about classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So it comprises of 90% of all Hodgkin lymphoma cases. Uh, typical age group is 15 to 35 years. Uh, when uh, clinically like uh, on true cut biopsy or on limited incisional biopsy, subtyping of classical Hodgkin lymphoma is not possible many a times. Uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma is uh, categorized into four subtypes on histomorphology. Uh, nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, lymphocyte rich Hodgkin lymphoma and lymphocyte depleted Hodgkin lymphoma. The aim of classifying um, Classical Hodgkin lymphoma into four subtypes uh, is not the therapeutic aim. However, each, each of this subtype has its uh, typical clinical presentation and uh, kind of a dif different disease outcome. So therefore, we classify even classical Hodgkin lymphoma into four subtypes. Now, what are the general clinical features? I have already touched upon this. Uh, lymphadenopathy, then contiguous spread of the disease. You will never see a uh, skip nodal involvement. There is always a chain of lymph nodes which is involved in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. If one sees uh, like skip nodal involvement, then one should think of NHL first rather than HL. And cutaneous involvement in Hodgkin lymphoma is very rare and if it is seen, is it is due to direct extension. So soft tissue deposits, etc. is very rarely seen in Hodgkin lymphoma. Also, there are subtype specific clinical features. So, as I've already mentioned, according to the four subtypes, like nodular sclerosis, most commonly presents with mediastinal involvement. Then, mixed cellularity and lymphocyte rich Hodgkin lymphoma presents with peripheral lymphadenopathy. And uh, lymphocyte depleted Hodgkin lymphoma has a, quite an aggressive clinical course and it may uh, involve bone marrow also. 
I will be discussing few cases which we had encountered at our uh, institute. So she was, uh, this first case was of a 18 year old female with dyspnea and chest pain since two months. Uh, she had history of low grade fever on and off. And also she had left cervical and left axillary lymphadenopathy. Uh, chest x-ray was done and a cervical lymph node excision was planned. So what we saw on this chest x-ray was this huge anterior mediastinal mass. And this was cut section of the cervical lymph node. As you can see in this cut section, this complete lymph node is now replaced by neoplastic mass. And this mass is basically fleshy, tan white, and vague nodules, like as you can see in this image, uh, vague nodules are seen. Then on microscopy, on scanner, what we could see is uh, this vague nodules of uh, neoplastic lymphoid cells separated by these thick fibrous bands, right? Uh, then we went on high power, and here you can see this RS cells with like lacuning at the periphery, very vacuolated cytoplasm. Uh, but, but these are very striking RS cells, right? Also, few mummified RS cells were also seen. We went ahead with the IHC. Uh, I would like to give a word of caution that even on histomorphology, even if you are 100% confident, uh, one should always sign out Hodgkin lymphoma as histomorphology favors Hodgkin lymphoma and IHC should always and always be undertaken for the final diagnosis. So we undertook IHC and uh, it came diffuse and strong positive for CD15, the RS cells, CD30 and it was CD20 negative. So the cell of interest, I would like to highlight that the cell of interest uh, in Hodgkin lymphoma are the RS cells and all IHC markers should always and always be interpreted in the RS cells and no other cells. So CD20, as you can see this by the red arrow over here, it is typically negative. Then uh, this case was positive for uh, EBV virus. So we run uh, at our center, we run a marker for EBV infection, which is EBV LMP, which shows cytoplasmic positivity. And PAX5 was dim. As you can see, so PAX5 is a marker of B cell. Uh, these reactive B cells in the background shows diffuse strong nuclear positivity. However, uh, the RS cells shows very dim and uh, granular, this granular positivity. So, a diagnosis of nodular sclerosis, classical Hodgkin lymphoma was ultimately signed out. This was the second case of 48 year old male with dyspnea and chest pain since two months. He had a history of low grade fever on and off and presented with axillary lymphadenopathy. The excisional biopsy of axillary lymph node was done. So on microscopy, we again saw uh, uh, these, uh, these small cells, lymphocyte, uh, like lymphocyte-like cells. And also we could see these typical uh, Aulai-like cells, right? Uh, the same image over here, here you can see uh, these uh, RS-like cells in the background of lymphocytes. So again, we ran IHC, which showed strong CD15 and CD30 positivity in the RS cells. And CD20 was negative. So I know that you are seeing all brown staining over here, but can you see these gaps? Like these are the RS cells which are typically CD20 negative. And what positive are, these are the reactive B cells in the background. Also, CD3 was positive in the uh, reactive T cells in the background. And this RSL, as you can see over here, is typically negative. So this is a very classical case of lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, there's a word of caution over here that uh, while reporting lymphocyte-rich Hodgkin lymphoma, one should always keep one of the most common DD, which is nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. However, nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin lymphoma has a completely different immunoprofile, like exactly, rather exactly opposite immunoprofile 
as it is negative for CD50 and CD30, it is positive for OCT2 and BOP1. And it is CD20 positive. So uh, this would have been positive in NLPHL, CD20. And uh, this is negative in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Now coming to the next case, he was a 37-year-old male immunocompromised with axillary lymphadenopathy. He had all kinds of B symptoms and uh, on examination, not only axillary lymphadenopathy, he had extensive cervical and inguinal lymphadenopathy. So an axillary lymph node excision was done and this was the cut section. And on microscopy, what we saw was these uh, large cells in a background of mixed cell population comprising of eosinophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells, etc. Also, again, these RS cells were seen. So, uh, again, here, I know we all like, like tend to have that temptation that we can just sign this out as mixed cellularity Hodgkin lymphoma, but yes, you can, but still, IHC should always and always be done. So we ran IHC and obviously it was CD15, CD30 positive, octobob one negative. And hence we signed this out as mixed cellularity Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, uh, this case was really an interesting case. So this was a 60 year old male immunocompromised with extensive generalized lymphadenopathy. GC was very poor and uh, uh, the most accessible and palpable lymph node that is cervical lymph node we excised this lymph node and we got the cut section. So this was the cut section. So what, these are very large cells as, as you can see in this second image. So uh, we thought that, is it a METS from some unknown primary? So we were really not sure. Uh, then we like, we took help of our radiologist and they were like, uh, no, he doesn't have any malignancy, like uh, any primary elsewhere but he had extensive lymphadenopathy. So we, on histomorphology, we just signed this out as a, a metastasis of poorly differentiated malignancy because we were not really sure that what we are looking at. And hence, IHC was advised and we ran the IHC. So we started from the basics, like whether it's a lymphoma, whether it's a carcinoma or whether it's a sarcoma. So we ran CD45 for lymphoma, PAN-CK for carcinoma and bimentin for sarcoma. And all these cells to our surprise turned out to be CD45 positive. Then, uh, so the next thought was, okay, now this is a lymphoma. Now, which kind of lymphoma are we looking at? So one diagnosis, uh, one differential was definitely ALCL. So according to that, we applied the IHC. It was CD, the CD30 positivity was seen only in the RS cells and it was EMA and ALK negative. So we were a bit, uh, bit very not convinced. So we talked to our medical oncologist and he was like, he, this doesn't, uh, the clinical picture doesn't fit into ALCL. So then we again started thinking of what other differentials could, uh, could we think of. And then we thought of this entity that is lymphocyte depleted Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, the clinical picture fitted into that uh, uh, in the picture of lymphocyte depleted Hodgkin lymphoma. And we applied CD15 uh, in this case and it was diffuse and strong positive in the RS cells. So again, the differential of ALCL was uh, ruled out in this case because first of all, it was EMA and ALK negative. And secondly, CD30 positivity in ALCL is seen in all the cells and just not, they are not just restricted to the RS-like cells. So this is, uh, this is a very important point uh, to distinguish lymphocyte depleted Hodgkin lymphoma from ALCL. ALK negative ALCL. So this was a case of lymphocyte depleted classical Hodgkin lymphoma. This is the last case. 40 year old male presented with left axillary lymphadenopathy since four months. He did not have any other complaints. His GC was great. And on examination, we could feel firm to hard left axillary lymph node. So a lymph node excision was done. This was a microscopy. So 
what we saw was uh, this is the entire lymph node is replaced uh, replaced by vague nodules of uh, neoplastic lymphoid cells there are no collagen bands but yes there are vague nodules so basically we were like what we are looking at is it an nhl low grade nhl or like what it is so on high power however we saw these rs cells mononuclear rs cells um in a background of these small lymphocyte like small cells so yes there was a clinic like we histomorphologically we suspected that this could be nlphl and hence we ran ihc and it shows uh, showed diffuse cd20 positivity in these rs cells uh, it was diffusely positive oc2 and bob1 in the rs cells oc2 and bob1 are nuclear stains and it was cd15 and cd30 negative and so a diagnosis of nlphl was signed out <coughs> who uh, recognizes six immuno architectural patterns of nlphl that is a to f uh, pattern c d e and f are relatively aggressive in their uh, clinical course however its uh, therapeutic implication is not that great one of the most uh, common differential of nlphl is as i have already mentioned lymphocyte rich hodgkin lymphoma and other differential is dlbcl with rs like cells so dlbcl with rs like cell cells will show diffuse cd20 positivity like in all cells not just into the in the rs like cells and they 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 will be they are monoclonal uh, uh they are monoclonal right so they will show diffuse cd20 positivity here is a word of caution so diagnosis of hodgkin lymphoma should always be done with a pinch of salt uh, one should always take into consideration abnormal clinical presentation as we all know that uh, any tumor doesn't read books so even a typical typical case of hodgkin lymphoma on histomorphology may not have a typical clinical presentation then uh, there might be inadequate tissue sampling like in core biopsies so so this is for my uh, colleague diagnostic physicians that a diagnosis of any lymphoma should be refrained on core biopsy then non representative lymph node like even if you have a slightest doubt that you are not looking at a representative lymph node then a repeat biopsy should always be asked for without any hesitation uh tissue processing errors can uh, alter the ihc expression then morphological differential should always be considered and ultimately subjective variability is always there then there are certain pre analytical factors which should be considered uh, in cases of a lymphoma uh, this thing has already been discussed by my seniors uh, but still i would just like to brush up that uh, lymph node of a lymphoma should always be uh, bread loaf and not cut in a longitudinal axis and each section has has its own uh, use like two sections should be kept for histology and ihc one for touch imprint one for phenotyping and cytogenetics etc <coughs> there are certain uh, nuances in ihc interpretation one should know where to look for ihc not all brown is positive right so one should know that which are the normal cells uh what is the ihc the where the ihc has come then one should know about the aberrant expression so aberrant expression means uh wrong expression wrong staining in the wrong cells and uh, one should always be careful about primary refractory hodgkin lymphoma and uh, lymph nodes in post chemotherapy specimen so in both cases there is loss of uh, antigen expression and uh, abnormal ihc expression and ultimately there are technical errors while staining ihc just a small word about true cut biopsy so true cut biopsy this is how we see uh, on true cut biopsy either i would like to take up an example of a pizza 
So in case of a pizza on true cut, I would just uh, be able to see pepperoni or the cheese or the crust. And ultimately I'm asked what type of pizza it is. So it is not possible for me just to, just to like after seeing just pepperoni or cheese or just crust to tell what kind of pizza it is, right? So ultimately I need to see the entire pizza. So in cases of a lymphoma, you need to see the entire lymph node to even suspect what kind of lymphoma it is. So a diagnosis on core and also on FNA should always and always be discouraged. This is FNA uh, at periphery. I know it is a very fast technique and uh, like uh, clinicians are like, you know, we have to treat the patient, we have to treat the patient, but we should not come under pressure and a whole node excision should always be done. And ultimately signing out of report should always be done on IHC. There are certain morphologic mimics of RS-like cells, like immunoblast resemble RS-like cells. The cells of ALCL uh, resemble RS-like cells. So differentiation should always be kept in mind. Also, Hodgkin lymphoma has an extensive um, differential diagnosis, including B-cell lymphoma, T-cell lymphomas, and some even non uh, uh, lymphomatous uh, condition which may show these RS-like cells and we may suspect it as Hodgkin lymphoma but ultimately as I've already told a uh, diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma should always be signed out on IHC. There are certain emerging biomarkers in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, PDL1 is one of them. Anti-PDL1 therapy has been extensively tried in uh, chemotherapy resistant Hodgkin lymphoma. From our institute, we have sent a couple of cases and um, they are doing great. So yes, anti pd one therapy is into uh, like is into course for the treatment of refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. And ultimately, integrated approach is a need of the hour. Uh, my senior doctor Radhika Pagi Madam has already discussed. So one should always know everything, right, from history to clinical presentation to lab labs. Uh, and also they should be touched with the colleague radiologist and uh, nuclear medicine guys also. One should be in touch with the treating oncologist that has your diagnosis responded to the therapy which he or she has given. And ultimately in medicine, one plus one is not equal to two and uh, lateral thinking should always be there. Even if commoner diagnosis, we have always been taught that commoner diagnosis first but a, a lateral thinking should always be kept in mind. And this is for my diagnostic physicians. We are consultants, consultant. So what matters most is how we see yourself. Thank you so much. You have to know a lot to know how little you know. So lymphoma is unending. Hodgkin lymphoma can also uh, keep you in a, uh, like, like it may even mislead you. So one need to know a lot. Thank you so much. Good. We a very nice talk by Dr. Ajika. Uh, thank you, so ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma uh, now let's have two interesting case discussion. First, I would like to call Dr. Shraddha Mandira, who is doing fellowship in cytopathology in National Cancer Institute, Nagpur. She will discuss an interesting case of marginal zone lymphoma. The session will be chaired by Dr. Pacha Mujeti Ma'am. I request Dr. Shraddha to, uh, to start the discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Shraddha Mahindra, currently pursuing my fellowship in cytopathology at National Cancer Institute, Nagpur. At the outset, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our organizers for today's CME on the topic lymphomas, which I'm sure many of us will agree is the need of the hour. So coming to my topic, that is marginal zone lymphomas, a case-based approach. Case number one, a 57-year-old female presented to our OPD with complaints of generalized weakness since one to two months, pain in abdomen, nausea, Decreased intake since 15 to 20 days. On examination, her GC was moderate. She was erfibrile, had cervical and axillary lymphadenopathy. 
XHS showed consolidation on the right side with minimal pleural effusion. CT abdomen and pelvis showed multiple conglomerating abdominal lymph nodes and bilateral inguinal lymph nodes, the largest measuring 2 by 1.2 centimeters in the left inguinal region. Liver and spleen were unremarkable. So a thorough laboratory workup was done. Hemogram showed a TLC of 4,000. Hemoglobin was 7.4 grams per deciliter. RBC count was 2.9 million. Platelets were 28,000. There was a relative lymphocytosis with 68%. CRP was elevated, that is 198. ESR was also raised, that is 40 millimeters per hour. Serum ferritin was elevated. HIV, HBSAG, and HCV were negative. Serum LDH was elevated, that is 8,890 units per liter. So a PET scan was done, which showed hypermetabolic, supradiaphragmatic, infradiaphragmatic, right axillary, and mediastinal nodes, also abdominal and bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy. Liver, spleen, and marrow appear to be unremarkable. So as we can see on the PET scan, the SUV max was highest in the axillary lymph node. That is why this was biopsied. Grossly, we received a single well-encapsulated globular mass, which was measuring 2 by 1.3 centimeters. Microscopy revealed partial lymph node effacement, showing a nodular growth pattern, infiltrate composed predominantly of small lymphoid cells with slightly irregular nuclear membranes, and mixed with large cells and occasional plasma cells. So differentials based on the clinical presentation, radiology, and histopathological findings for marginal zone hyperplasia, follicular lymphoma with marginal zone differentiation, small lymphocytic lymphoma, that is CLL, SLL, then uh, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and IgG4-related diseases. So we are all aware that marginal zone hyperplasia and lymphoma can be differentiated, proving the clonality of B cells with IgH gene rearrangement. For the others, we had to do immunohistochemistry. So that showed positivity for CD20, CD43, Pax5, BCL2. Plasma cells showed positivity for MUM1 and were kappa restricted. CD5 and CD23, which are markers of SLL, were negative in our case. CD10, BCL6, markers of follicular lymphoma were also negative. Cyclin D1, SOX11, markers of mantle cell lymphoma were also negative in our case. So a point worth mentioning here is a new IHC marker, MNDA, which is myeloid cell nuclear differentiation antigen protein expressed by these marginal zone cells. It has a tendency to colonize the germinal centers. It can help differentiate marginal zone lymphomas from follicular lymphomas, which do not show MNDA protein expression. So a diagnosis of nodal marginal zone lymphoma was arrived at. These are derived from the post-germinal center B cells, constituting less than 2% of all non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, most commonly seen in adults aging from 50 to 60 years. Similar incidence in both the genders. Also up in the pediatric population, a pediatric variant of nodal marginal zone has been encountered. Sites commonly involved are lymph nodes, Bone marrow and peripheral blood can be rarely involved. Association with hepatitis C infection has been documented. Also increased incidence in women with autoimmune diseases as seen. So clinical features, localized or generalized lymphadenopathy with bone marrow involvement in less than 50% of these patients. B symptoms can be seen in the pediatric variant. Predominantly young males are affected, localized in the head and neck region. So in cases with low tumor burden and clinically asymptomatic patients, wait and watch strategy is advocated. Because of CD20 positivity, rituximab can be combined with chemotherapy. Radiation can be considered in localized disease and pediatric nodal marginal zone are managed conservatively. It's an indolent lymphoma with five-year overall survival of 60 to 70%. Factors associated with worse prognosis include advanced stage at presentation, high clinical stage, and B symptoms. Pediatric variant is associated with an excellent prognosis and long-term survival. So four immunoarchitectural patterns. Most commonly, we encounter the nodular and the diffuse ones. Also, interfollicular and perifollicular may be seen. Other cytomorphological features include sclerotic blood vessels, 
stromal sclerosis, monocytoid, and plasma cells. So pediatric nodal marginal zone lymphoma affects young males and usually the head neck region, CD20, CD43, BCL2, immunoglobulin D, and light chain restriction can be seen. Prognosis is again excellent, needs to be differentiated from pediatric follicular lymphoma and marginal zone hyperplasia. So this brings us to the next case, a 46-year-old female who came to our OPD with complaints of right-sided otalgia, odinophagia since one to two months. On examination, her GC was moderate or febrile. Oral cavity examination showed an ulceroproliferative lesion over the right tonsillar region and tonsillolingual sulcus, measuring approximately 3.5 by 2.5 centimeter. Right neck nodes were palpable. CECT showed an asymmetric thickening in the right buccal mucosa vaccinator complex, maximum thickness of 5 mm, also involved the adjacent structures and eroding the floor of the right maxillary sinus. Few and large nodes were seen at right level 1b and 2, the largest measuring 1.7 by 1.2 centimeter. The patient had no history of fever or pruritus during this period. She declared no family history of any hematolymphoid malignancies. A complete laboratory workup showed a hemoglobin of 12.2. PLC count was 10,000 with 41% lymphocytes. RBCs were 4.6 million. Platelet count was again within normal limits, that is 3,54,000. HIV, HBS, AG, and HCV were negative. LDH again was raised, that is 1,100 units per liter. A punch biopsy from the right tonsillar fossa was taken. Grossly, we received two to three irregular grayish white tissue pits aggregating one by 0.5 centimeter. Microscopy showed an ulcerated strip of stratified squamous epithelium with subepithelial tissue showing these diffuse sheets of atypical lymphoid cells. Malignant cells could not, squamous cells could not be appreciated in the present biopsy. So seeing these diffuse sheets of these small monotonous cells, a panel of lymphoma was advocated. So CD45, CD20, CD43 were positive in the tumor cells. Background positivity for CD3 was appreciated. These tumor cells were immunonegative for CD10, BCL2, BCL6, MUM1, cyclin D1, and CD5. So we arrived at a diagnosis of extranodal marginal zone lymphoma, also commonly referred to as maltoma, that is the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. So commonly seen in the terminal ileum in the form of pears patches, lung, that is bronchial or tracheal-associated lymphoid tissue, skin, nose, vulvo vaginal tract, so Isaacson and Wright were the first to recognize a group of lymphomas that arose in these extranodal sites. Stomach, we all know, is the most commonest site of encountering mild lymphomas. So their association with gastritis caused by Helicobacter pylori infection is seen. Mainly affects adults over the age of 60 years. Clinical signs symptoms mainly related to the location of the tumor. Increasing evidence uh, association with chronic inflammatory episodes and autoimmune diseases or bacterial stimulation has been seen. The most common uh, clinical symptom is local sw swelling with or without ulceration. Underlying bones may be affected. Differential diagnosis, as in our case, was squamous cell carcinoma, lymphoid epithelial lesions. Also, uh, these tumors tend to progress to aggressive uh, high-grade B-cell lymphomas like DLBCL. So in about 10 to 15% of these cases, so they need to be picked up early. This is a table showing the site-wise detailed workup for extranodal marginal zone lymphomas. Stomach, the most common site we encounter. So on HNE stained sections, we can see in the biopsies the Helicobacter pylori are demonstrated. Special stains like MGG and Wharton silver stain can also be used. Fecal antigen and breath tests can also be done. In cases of salivary glands, association with Jogren syndrome has been seen. So anti-Rho and anti-La antibodies are demonstrated in these cases. Also, H. pylori eradication therapy in cases of gastric maltomas has become mandatory now. These are the various genetic alterations that we see in these maltomas. This brings us to the last case, that is case number three, a 52-year-old male who came with complaints of cough with expectoration and fever on and off since two to three months, GC was moderate. He was febrile at present. CT thorax showed non-necrotic bilateral supraclavicular 
axillary and mediastinal lymphadenopathy, the largest node measuring 3 by 3 centimeter in the right axillary region. USG abdomen pelvis was done, which showed moderate to marked splenomegaly with dilatation of the splenoportal vein and moderate prostatomegaly. So a detailed workup was done, which showed hemoglobin of 3.7 grams per deciliter, leukocytosis, that is 33,840 cells, uh, out of which 90% were lymphocytes. RBC count was 1.4 million, platelets were 28,000. Peripheral smear examination in this case became very vital. We saw many atypical lymphoid cells with these characteristic feathery projections at one site, which was termed as the villous lymphocytes. Seeing this, immunophenotyping was advised. Also, HIV, HBSAG, and HCV were negative in our case. LDH was raised, that is 856 units per liter. So flow cytometry panel showed positivity for CD19, CD20, CD22, CD45, and 11C. So seeing this, a diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma B-cell type was made. Also, flow markers like CD25, CD103, CD123 were negative in our case, thereby ruling out hairy cell leukemia. Femoral lymph node excisional biopsy was done, which showed a single well-encapsulated globular mass measuring 3 by 2 centimeter. On microscopy, we saw effacement of this lymph node architecture by sheets of monotonous small lymphoid cells having inconspicuous nucleoli, clumped chromatin, and scanned cytoplasm. So a diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was done and IHC was advised. So on immunohistochemistry, we got positivity for CD45, CD20, CD79A, and BCL2. Other markers like CD3, CD5, CD10, CD23, 43, and cyclin D1 were negative in our case. This led us to the diagnosis of splenic marginal zone lymphomas, which are indolent B-cell neoplasms involving the spleen, bone marrow, and the peripheral blood. It's a rare disorder accounting for less than 2% of all lymphoid neoplasms, and patients are aged usually in the age range of 50 to 60 years with a slight female predominance. So clinical presentation, apart from splenomegaly, is also autoimmune hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukocytosis, hepatomegaly in few cases, peripheral blood involvement in the form of villous lymphocytes, lymphadenopathy, and paraproteinemias. A small percentage of these cases are also associated with hepatitis C infection. So bone marrow involvement can be documented on bone marrow biopsy by staining uh, with CD20, which highlights the intertrabecular and intrasinusoidal lymphoid aggregates. As per the recent 2020 ESMO guidelines, diagnosis of splenic marginal zone lymphoma can be established without a splenectomy specimen through combination of peripheral blood, bone marrow, flow cytometry, and immunohistochemistry findings. I will reiterate here that splenic marginal zone lymphoma is a diagnosis of exclusion. Amongst the molecular and cytogenetic testing, there is deletion of 7Q and NOTCH2 mutation with are commonly encountered. Treatment options include splenectomy, due to CD20 positivity, rituximab can be combined, fludarabine, chlorambucil can be used. Hepatitis C infection, the associated cases may go into remission with antiviral therapy. Again, transformation to diffuse large B-cell lymphomas occurs in 10 to 15% of these cases and cases with 7Q deletion appear to be at a greater risk for transformation. So this is a pictorial representation showing the various molecular pathways in nodal, extranodal, as well as splenic marginal zone lymphomas. This is the treatment protocol that is commonly followed in all the three marginal zone lymphomas. So thank you all for your patient hearing. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Shraddha. Thank you, Dr. Shadda, for sharing such an interesting case with us. Thank you, ma'am. For second case, I would like to call Dr. Anuja Nasri, who is also fellow in cytopathology at National Cancer Institute, Nagpur. She will discuss a, a case of mantle cell lymphoma and Richard's transformation. The session will be chaired by Dr. Prachi Sanchetu, ma'am. Dr. Anuja. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I would like to thank all the seniors for giving me this opportunity. Today I will be presenting two cases, one which we are quite familiar with and other one which is a bit rare. So moving on to case number one. A 51 years old male was admitted with complaints of shortness of breath, dizziness and increased fatigue. A CCT thorax and abdomen was advised which revealed bilateral cervical, inguinal and abdominal lymphadenopathy. Complete laboratory workup revealed hemoglobin of 10.5 gram percent, total count of 6,540, and platelets were adequate. The biochemical parameters were within normal limits except for LDS, which was raised. An inguinal lymph node was excised and sent for examination. So we received a single lymph node measuring 3 to 2.5 into 2 centimeters. On histology, as here we can see, there was effacement of the nodal architecture and it was infiltrated by sheets of small to medium sized lymphoid cells having plum chromatin and irregular nuclear margins. So, considering this histologically, the differentials which we considered were mantle cell lymphoma and small cell lymphoma. So, according to that, an IHC panel was put, which included CD5, CD23, CD20 for uh, small cell lymphoma, cyclin D1 for mantle cell lymphoma, and CD10 BCL2, particularly for follicular lymphoma, along with CD3 and KI67. So, an IHC, as we can see here, the cells showed strong diffuse positivity for CD20. They were also positive for CD5. The KI67 index was about 30%, but they were negative for CD23, CD10, and BCL2 excluding the possibility of SLL and follicular lymphoma. But to our surprise, cyclin D1 was also negative. Uh, but as we were strongly suspecting mantle cell lymphoma, we subsequently added SOX11 to the HC panel, which ultimately came positive. Hence, the final diagnosis was given as mantle cell lymphoma. So what mantle cell lymphoma? This is an aggressive mature B-cell neoplasm with monomorphic small to medium-sized lymphoid cells it accounts for about 3 to 10 percent of all non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, and mostly affects the middle-aged individuals with slight male predominance. The, cytogenic, the cytogenetic abnormalities which are typically seen in mantle cell lymphoma are translocation L114 and CCND1 mutation, including for cyclin D1, which is seen in about more than 95 percent of the cases. But as in our case, it can be negative in about 5 percent of the cases. The patient mostly present with stage 3, stage 4 disease uh, with lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly and sometimes bone marrow involvement. Some patients may have marked lymphocytosis. Lymph nodes are the most commonly involved organs, but the, it may involve spleen or bone marrow and rarely invo uh, involves sites include gastrointestinal tract, Walder's ring and lungs. On microscopy, there will be nodular, diffuse, or rarely follicular lymphoid proliferation. Uh, the cells are composed of small to medium lymph lymphoid cells with irregular nuclear contours, dispersed chromatin, and unconspicuous nucleoli. Uh, recently, four variants have been uh, introduced by WHO, which include blastoid, pleomorphic, small cell, and marginal zone-like. Important point notice. Uh, to notice is histological transformation of mantle cell lymphoma to a typical diffuse large B cell lymphoma does not occur. Immunophenotypically, the cells will be positive for CD5, cyclin D1, and SOX11, along with BCL2, FMC7, CD43, and MAM1, whereas the cells will be negative for germinal center markers like CD10, CD23, and BCL6. SOX11 is the most sensitive marker that is about in more than 90% of the cases, including cyclin D1 negative and blastoid cases. LEF1, which is a recently introduced marker, will be positive in blastoid and pleomorphic variant, and uh, CD200 positivity will be seen in leukemic non nodal variant. And RCHOP is the routinely uh, used uh, treatment for the mantle cell lymphoma, whereas other uh, agents like bendamustine or ibrutinib are uh, also now being introduced recently. Uh, so amongst uh, the variants, blastoid and pleomorphic variant are the aggressive variants, other, uh, others like small cell and marginal zone like other, other variants. 
so on histology as here we can see this is the classic variant of uh, mant classic mantle cell lymphoma this is the blastoid variant which is showing blastoid morphology with high insertion prominent nucleoli here this is the pleomorphic variant as we can appreciate the nuclei of the cells are quite pleomorphic as the name suggests so here this picture shows all the case uh, all the variants are positive for satellite lymphoma on ilc so uh, leukemic non neural mantle cell lymphoma this is a newly introduced term by uh, who in this there will be peripheral blood bone marrow and uh, sometimes splenic involvement without significant adenopathy which is important if the patients present with high total count and lymphocytosis the cells have uniform nuclei sometimes prominent nucleoli as here we can see so the differentials to be uh, included are pro lymphocytic leukemia acute leukemia and chronic lymphocytic leukemia the neoplastic cell in this are typically cyclin d1 positive but sox 11 negative which can be proven on bone marrow biopsy this uh, this lesion has less complex karyotype than classic mantle cell lymphoma and hence it has a better prognosis but this this is may progress to an aggressive disease and uh, hence a follow up is advised now about in situ mantle cell neoplasia uh, this is an incidental finding during the evaluation of mantle cell lymphoma other malignant lymphomas the presence of ccn d1 rearrangements in the cells of interest will be seen the presence of cyclin d1 positive lymphoid cells will be restricted to the mantle zones of the hyperplastic occurring lymphoid follicle as here we can see that the cells are restricted to the mantle zones only identifying this entity is important because such cases may progress to overt mantle cell lymphoma and hence a follow up is advised so this was all about mantle cell lymphoma now moving on to case number 2 a 60 year male who was a known case of cls since 10 years which was even typically proven and had not received any treatment yet now suddenly uh, presented with complaints of fever and sudden weight loss so a complete clinical workup was advised the laboratory workup revealed total count of 80000 hemoglobin was 10 for 10.1 g percent and platelets were adequate serum ldh and beta to microglobulin were raised and other biochemical uh, parameters were within normal limits the present pet ct revealed progression in the size of cervical and intra abdominal lymph nodes uh, than the older scan and hence consider considering all these features a progression or transformation was suspected clinically and hence a ct guided biopsy was taken from the largest abdominal lymph node with highest suv max on uh, so grossly we received three linear cores ranging in length from 0.5 to 1.2 cm on histology as here we can see there were sheets of medium to large size lymphoid cells having fine chromatin and prominent nucleoli along with brisk mitosis so considering this histology we strongly suspected high grade non hodgkin lymphoma probably dlbcl and according to that an ihc panel was put so as here we can see there is strong positivity for cd20 and the cells were also positive for bcl6 mom1 bcl2 and cmig whereas the cells were negative for cd10 and cd23 the ki67 index was very high which was about 90% and cd3 positivity was seen in the background t cell so considering all this the final diagnosis was given as diffuse large b cell lymphoma activated b cell type in a known case of cls that is richest transformation now about richard's transformation this was first described in 1928 by morris richter it occurs in approximately approximately 2 to 9% of cll patients occurs from 1 to 8 years after the diagnosis but may occur much later as in our case that is about after 10 years important point to note here is the risk of development of rt increases when the cll patients are treated with chemotherapy so when should we suspect rhs transformation so when the patient present with elevated serum ldh progressive lymphadenopathy dramatic increase in systemic symptom that is fever weight loss etc monoclonal gammopathy and extra nodal involvement so as uh, we have seen in our case all three uh, first uh, features were present 
रिजर्स ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन मोस्टली प्रेजेंस एज डीएल बीसीएल दैट इज इन ओवर 90 परसेंट ऑफ द केसेस बट इन अबाउट 5 परसेंट केसेस इट मे प्रेजेंट एज क्लासिक हॉजकिन लिम्फोमा एंड वेरी रेयरली इट मे प्रेजेंट एज डीसेल लिम्फोमा प्लाज्मा ब्लास्टिक लिम्फोमा एंड अदर्स now about genetic profile the uh, richest transformation can be either clonally related to the patient's underlying cll in which the, the cll will be uh, will have uh, unmutated IG, igh v and the survival time of this patient will be one year that is very poor and in uh, the richer transformation can be clonally unrelated to the patient's underlying cll in this the cll v will have unmutated igh v and the prognosis will be identical to the de novo dlpcl some other genetic alterations which are seen in richer transformation are gain of cmic uh, bcl2 mdm4 and losses of t53 and cdkn2 the risk factor which are associated with uh, richer transformation include uh, the patients presenting with advi uh, advanced stage this is at first cll diagnosis that is ri stage 3 4 or lymph node more than 3 cm or patients harboring polling mutations uh, predominantly 11q 17p notch 1 and t53 and patients presenting with elevated levels of zap 70 beta 2 microglobulin or cd38 at the time of diagnosis so all such cases will be more prone for transformation to richer cells so to conclude uh, for the diagnosis of richer transformation selection of most appropriate lymph node uh, is crucial for example selecting the largest node or node with the highest suv max the standard arch of regimen used for the treatment of de novo dl bcl has limited efficacy in dl bcl type of richer transformation though newer uh, drugs like ibrutinib pembrolizumab pem uh, pembrolizumab are now being introduced but still the prognosis of richer transformation disease is very poor and the medial survival in the patients with transformation is about 8 months so this was all about richer transformation thank you good afternoon everyone i will thank you ma'am thank you dr rajan for sharing your insights with us Now, thank you dr praji sanjeevi ma'am to give her expert comment thank you can you hear me yes get yes, your audible ma'am first of all many congratulations to the organizer dr pratika davande madam for uh, organizing this very excellent webinar and uh, commendable job by department of pathology national cancer institute and very uh, on uh, of organizing this uh, very lucid uh, webinar on the topic of lymphoma which is very much needed and uh, of, uh, having done a great job of it especially in the, the second session i would like to congratulate dr ashish dr shweta dr ankita for having uh, uh, given the presentations in a very simple basic and very easily understandable manners manner and uh, making it uh, 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 very uh, informative and uh, i think the case presentations were very novel uh, the cases were very novel and very well presented by uh, dr uh, shraddha and dr anuja uh, so congratulations once again and thank you for having me over thank you thank you ma'am as we do not have any uh, question answers in our chat box the session uh, will is it's open for discussion so you may use a uh, raise hand button to get yourself unmuted So there are no questions. 
It has been deep, been an enriching experience for one and all present here. And since all good things come to an end, we would like to proceed for the concluding speech by Dr. Pratima Dawande Ma'am, organizing chairperson for this session. Good afternoon, everybody. So this was, I must say, video. Uh, this this was, I must say, A A F. It means absolute academic fist. We were going through. Uh, thank you, my NCI friends, Dr. Anand sir, Dr. Meena, Kishore, Radhika, Chaitanya, then Ankita, Ashish, everybody, Shweta, Anuja, everybody. It was definitely a bright enlightenment on lymphoma to our gray cells. All participants must have enjoyed, I know it. And after a long time, we were in the company of lymphoma for a, such a long time. I think after my MD, I was in the company of lymphoma for such a long, long time for the first time. And it must have lessened everybody's confusion about the lymphoma or whatever the problems they come across while diagnosing them, everything. And it was a great session, I must say. Thank you once again. And with this, I declare the webinar completed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Meena. Do you want to say anything? Any comment from Meena? We also enjoyed it very much. It was our first uh, team event and all of us have really enjoyed and it was all possible because of you and your motivation. So we all thank you from the bottom of our hearts and let's have many more such events. Yes, definitely. In the future, we will look forward to how many more such events. Thank you so much. And thank you all participants. I must say I have seen the number 97. So all of you have, all of you have joined and must have got an enlightenment and thank you for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>